A-L. You are now rocking with that dude, Pascal. We be going wild. Haitian in the building, so, so, so original. Got the haters, got your feelings. Get your hands up to the ceiling. And keep them held high, cause St. Louis is ready. Forget about it, goodbye. Hold up, we just saying hi. Five somebody, rise up weekdays. Catch us live, somebody, let's go. Good morning. Good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Pascal Show. I hope everybody's finding this show in good spirits. Happy Friday to every single last one of y'all. Real talk, happy Friday. The happiest of Fridays to you guys. Um, You know, I know we've all had either a tough week or an easy week. Either way, good news is that the weekend is here. Or the weekend is coming up, okay? And uh, gets you an opportunity to just kind of relax, let your hair down, grab a libation if that's the thing that tickles your fancy or not, or be around some good friends and family. That's what matters the most. But today, I'm bringing up this conversation because uh, it matters. This story matters. This is a conversation. This is a case that has been going on for almost two years now. We're rounding up to the two-year anniversary in just, well, less than about a week from now, to be really honest. And so I wanted to bring this up and talk to you guys about this. And, of course, bring a good friend of the show. He's been on the show in the past, but the father of Daniel Robinson. He'll be on with us in just a short while. But I'm bringing this conversation up because you know what? This is a story that we need to start sharing. This is a conversation that needs to be out there, hashtagged, et cetera. This is the reason why I keep telling you guys like, I need y'all's help, okay? I need my fam's help with this. Share, talk about this. The more we talk about this, the more we can get justice. There's a lot of things that are going on through this case that, man, so many red flags. Not only just on the disappearance of this young man, okay, of Daniel Robinson, but also on how things are being handled within law enforcement and whatnot, within the things surrounding the search in this case of where is Daniel. So before we get into everything, I need you all to do me a favor because it also helps get the story out there too in this conversation as well hit that like button down below crush it please do that send it past 300 likes all right share this feed again let people know that we are live to talk about this sh- this conversation this case specifically and this story needs more light under more light shun upon it real talk and if you haven't done it yet please guys hit that subscribe button Be greatly appreciated. Crush it. Do it. Okay? We need more eyes on the stories that I've been covering recently. We need more eyes, more importantly, on this story as well. All right. Enough of that. Enough of that. uh, uh, The preaching, preaching. Okay? Enough of me getting on my soapbox. But we do need to talk about this. And, of course, as of... Almost two years ago, a young man by the name of Daniel Robinson, he was 24 years old on the day of his disappearance, okay? 24 years old. Look at that man. That's a good-looking man. Handsome young man. Hard-working young man, by the way. Had two jobs, which I will be explaining here in just a minute. But this young man was out in... Arizona on a work site. Something happened, which we will be getting into convers- in a conversation more about. He jumped into his car and he drove off and he disappeared. But a little more information about this young man. Okay, this young man was born with his right missing his right arm and forearm. But this is also a young man that was strong enough and proud enough to say, I don't need a prosthetic. I'm going to do this on my own. I can do this. I can live life without having a prosthetic. 
This young man learned many instruments, played sports, lived the life of a regular kid. And he was incredibly smart too. He became a geologist and got a gig or got a job as a hydrogeologist with Metrics New World Engineering. So he moved out to Phoenix to pursue his career in geology. And as you can see, this kid, this young man was full of life, happy. He was a happy young man. But then, as I said, on June 23rd, very strange things happened. He was out at a remote location with another coworker that has had never seen him before. They had never met before to assess a drill site. So as they were together, there were some things that apparently Ken Elliott, the person, the coworker that he was at the drill site with said, and I want to share that with you guys. It's very interesting. Let's take a look at this. Now, this is according to what Ken Elliott, the, one of the last people to see him before he jumped into his car and drive off, say, okay? Now, real quick, I'll just say this. The disappearance from the well site. They were at this drill site observing and assessing this remote site out in the desert, okay? Now, they said Ken Elliott said Daniel was initially fine as they discussed the weather and the job. It was an abnormally cool day for the area, and Ken had never met Robinson before, and they were, they were to work on a deep well. But within a short period, Robinson became distracted. Now, this is what, according, this is what Ken said, okay? He was just looking off into the desert. He had a very, very distant look in his eye. Whenever he'd turn around, uh, around again, he, I, I would look in at him and look into his eyes. The first thing I thought was that maybe he was on drugs or something, but his pupils were not dilated. From that standpoint, everything appeared to be normal. Then I thought this was a medical condition or something. I wasn't too sure. I kept watching him, but he just kept turning around and looking off into the desert. Then he just turned around and walked back over to his Jeep. And as I just and I just assumed he was going to get something out of his vehicle. And he opened the door, got in, sat down, put on a seatbelt, then looked at he looked at me and just waved at me and backed up and took off. Okay, so at that point, Robinson drove off in his blue Jeep Renegade. Elliot told his coworkers by phone about, about what had happened, assuming Daniel wasn't feeling well and that he would call in sick. However, no one heard from Daniel after that. And of course, we already know he was reported missing to Buckeye Police Department the same day. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because, one, let's be real. This is the last person that saw Daniel take off. And there's a lot of question of what happened here. Is there a was he having a mental breakdown? Was there is there mental health involved in this situation? What was really going on with Daniel that made him get into his car and just drive off into the desert? Now only 30 days later, and of course I'll show this to you guys here too, his car was found in a ravine in the middle of the desert, which, by the way, the car has a lot of new clues. There's a lot of information that has come from this car now, which we will be breaking down here in just a little bit. But I also do want to show with you guys and share with you guys the love of a father, a father that has stopped at nothing to find out where his son is. This man has searched high and low for the past almost two years 
looking for his son. Nonstop. And this man will not stop. This is why I'm very, very honored to bring back onto the show our friend and a man that I say, man, this is a man that won't quit. Please welcome Daniel, Daniel's father, David Robinson to the show. How you doing, my brother? All right. Thank you. How you doing today? Thanks so much for having me here. Anytime, man. Anytime. You know your family here. You That's know right. your family here. And everybody who's watching right now, please send as many purple emojis showing that he is fam on this on this show. Show him as much love. Purple Thank heart you. emojis right now. Okay. Now, first off, okay. I already said thank you, but I'm going to say it again, thank you. And I mean thank you because of your, ah, man, your tenacity, your never quitting, never stopping passion to finding out what has, hap what has happened to your son or at least where is your son. So I just wanted to say that really quick. I do appreciate your energy and your passion behind this case. Just have to say that. Yes, definitely. Um, I mean, that's what fathers do. You know, uh, one of the biggest parts is uh, just being a father. I'm honored, first of all, to have a, a son like my, like Daniel, as well as his siblings. Uh, you know, one of the main jobs as a father is to protect his family, uh, to no matter how old they get, you know, to protect your family. And uh, that's what I'm doing right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I appreciate you being just just doing what you have been doing. OK, because right. this is so right. hard. I can only imagine it's Father's Day right around the corner. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> no. Happy Father's Day, by the way. Yeah. OK, yeah. Um, but this is something about a father's love and a mm -hmm. father's care and passion. Um, and this shows a lot about who you are and how uh, I, I understand that you are a veteran as well. Uh, U.S. Army, That's correct. Um, leaving no soldier behind type of mentality this to me shows to me what kind of man you are and what 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 I, I can only imagine what kind of man you brought daniel up to be so we got to go all the way back to the very very beginning and i'm sorry for doing that because i know trust me i guarantee you i'm sure you have had these questions over and over and over oh, yeah. <laughs> at nauseum. But at the same time, for everyone who's out here, who's watching the show that does not know about this story, we're going to start from the very beginning. Sounds good. So when was the last time you spoke to your son before he went missing? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, the first time, I, uh, last time I spoke with Daniel was two days prior to him going missing. Uh, nothing was unusual about that conversation. He and I, uh, to give you a backdrop, we, we always talk for at least two hours. Uh, Daniel is one of those people uh, that, that has a lot of questions and uh, he's very inquisitive. I always want to know, uh, know things. He, he, he trusts me as a father. Uh, so our conversations are very extended. Uh, you know, one of the things is uh, that day in particular, uh, I speak with him, like I said, nothing stood out um, any different. Uh, when I talk to Daniel, I always, you know, it's, it's vice versa. If I'm talking to him or he's talking to me, we almost, it's almost like setting a, a schedule because uh, we have to uh, put that time aside. Let's say if Daniel was calling me and I have something to take care of, like I'm doing this interview, I tell him, hey, I'm going to have to call you back because I know it's going to be a two hour conversation. It's not going to be quick. So, but that's, that's the last time I spoke with Daniel, uh, two days uh, prior to him going missing. Um, and, uh, you know, that's one of the things that's very missed, uh, even currently, is, is, is heavily missed. Yeah, the conversations between you and your son, uh, right. and, and you guys would always have conversations. So your your relationship and your conversations with your son were open, fairly right. open. Uh, right. You guys had a good rapport. That's right. And, okay. You know, that's our family dynamics. Um, you know, he have uh, twin sisters and older brother um, in that group, and uh, you know, I, I see how close we are. Uh, for example, uh, my children. They all share the same passwords and they know each other's passwords and things like that. Whatever, um, whatever goes on with one, one of them, uh, the other know. I wouldn't know. You know, so we have a really good communication going on in our family. Um, you know, like I said, I don't know everything. Uh, but what I don't know, of course, his siblings would know. 
And then it just like I'm knowing because it would still come back to me. So, uh, but we have the regular uh, family dynamics. Uh, of course, Daniel's mother and I are divorced. We've been divorced for many years. Uh, but uh, we, we still, as a, uh, when I say a family unit, we still have the communication that we need. Uh, so that's Daniel. He, he come from a place like that. He come from a place where you have great dynamics. Yeah, no, I I, I understand that. Uh, you know, good, strong family foundation, um, good co-parenting as well. Um, and that's, that's good too. Um, obviously you raised a, a, a very good young man. Um, now, okay. The thing is, we just, I just read this piece and this is new. This is, this was a new piece for me at least. Okay. okay. Um, cause obviously I've only, you know, and I feel like a lot of other people kind of only know the broad strokes of the story. But one of the things that I found very interesting is this, this account. He is looking off. He's acting not as normal, not his normal self. He's acting fairly abnormal uh, on, on, at this particular site. He gets in his car. He drives off. Now, before we go off into the part of him disappearing, has there been any signs of mental health on behalf of Daniel? Or is this something brand new to you? It's a, uh, very brand new to me. Uh, like I said, I did talk to Daniel two days prior to him going, excuse my voice, you guys, I've been having issues with that. Um, but you know, I talked to him two days prior to uh, him going missing. Now, like I said, there was no indication of anything going on. Uh, matter of fact, I think he, was, he just came out from uh, hanging out with one of his buddies uh, uh, at a local establishment. Uh, but, but he had plans also with his sister to go hiking that weekend. Uh, we had plans that I would be there in July to see his vehicle for the first time, uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, spend time with his sister, uh, his sisters, uh, and uh, one of his sister's husband. Uh, but the thing is, the thing is, uh, there was no indication, no indication of any kind of uh, mental uh, uh, depression or uh, things that have been put out there. Uh, from my standpoint, I can't say from day to day to day because I wasn't there uh, two days after um, um, I spoke to my son last. I wasn't there at, 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 at that well site with my son, of course. So I'm not a witness to that. But I can say some of the questions I have about that account is, is, is just the timeline. For instance, he said that Daniel and he, he and Daniel was there at the well site from 9 o'clock to 9.15. That's a lot of assessment in 15 minutes of, of not knowing a person. Daniel's a black man. Uh, it's hard to look in a black man's eye in daylight and see if his eyes are uh, dilated or not. And, and Daniel would not stand there and let somebody do that anyway in the first place. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so those assessments that he have, um, I don't know reason why he can have an assessment on um, of just knowing somebody, uh, and then have some some type of um, uh, opinion about that. Also, lastly, I want to throw in real quick. Um, you know, of course, uh, in my uh, in my uh, efforts, I have been following his story. I actually got on the ground and followed those story. I put myself in Daniel's in shoes and actually went to that well site and stand there and look around. Uh, to see if I was if I was staring off in the desert, you know, just replay those things, and that didn't even add up because uh, the brush that was around the area of the well site was real dense. There was no place for him to look um, out into the desert. You couldn't even see the desert area. Uh, so it was just some things I had to question off the uh, initial when I heard those stories. Understandable. Is this the well site that you're talking about right here? Uh, no, that is that is actually a mine. Uh, that is south uh, 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 southeast of. Uh, where the vehicle uh, will eventually be found. Um, that is something that we found near a corral, um, the same corral that the rancher was uh, speaking of that we would talk about, uh, that, that was speaking of when where the vehicle was found. Uh, mm -hmm. That's, that's a, 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 actually a mine. Uh, we thought it gotcha. was a well, but it's actually a mine. Okay, I see, I see. Then, then I got to ask you, though. I, now, I understand that this last eyewitness, Ken, says, okay, I didn't know if he was on drugs. I, I looked. It didn't seem like his eyes were dilated, so on and so forth. Did or did Daniel ever experiment with drugs? Did he ever have any issues with drugs? Do you know anything about that? Can you can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, sure. I could say Daniel is a weed smoker, and I'm, that's no doubt about that. Um, I had issues with him, uh, with his friends. Of course, he, he lived a college experience with his friends in, in College of Charleston. And uh, he's a weed smoker. I'm not a weed smoker, but, you know, as a, as a parent, not being a weed smoker, of course, this seemed like uh, something I wouldn't approve of, of course. Uh, but once he got to Arizona and he told me, hey, it is this legal in the state, I was like, oh, my God, you know, it was that kind of thing for me. 
Um, but you know, as a parent, but yes, that, that he, he definitely did it as a recreational, uh, type deal, just like I would, um, at the end of a long day and have a beer, uh, what we call a happy hour or something. Uh, I, I believe Daniel, uh, would u- utilize, uh, marijuana in that fashion. Now I can't say, uh, give him some backdrop as well. Daniel has, uh, been very responsible. He's a responsible young man. Um, in our conversations, he had to, started off in that, out there in Arizona with a hoop deal, what I like to call uh, a car. He had to fix and repair almost daily. And, and you know, he utilized those skills I taught him and his sisters and the brother um, how to fix cars. So he kept that thing running because he wanted to be responsible and work on time. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm assuming he'd he been doing that for years. He's been doing that for the time. He'd been working for Matrix New World constantly, uh, uh, making sure he's doing the right thing on the Interesting. job. Interesting. Okay, so, so weed... Little yep. Mary Jane, a little bit. He was a recreational smoker, or was he just a wake and bake guy? <laughs> I, I I, I'm, I'm just asking. I mean, you know, because if you if you think about it, I, I, and of course, this is just me with this. This is me in speculation land, guys. Okay, right, right. Um, but you know, could there have been a possibility of him smoking something that was maybe a bit too strong or? spiked with something that could just you know uh make him snap in a way you know that's one of one of the things that uh would be a hypothetical or or, you know this assumption because i did hear uh for instance um uh, later on um, those are some of the theories that we went to explore when i say we uh my investigator at the time uh wanted to explore uh because we don't know you know a lot of times um, it depends on because they have dispensaries. Of course, those are very, uh, what I understand, safe uh, for people who smoke weed and marijuana. Uh, but if you was to go out and, and get it from somewhere, another source, because they do have uh, a restriction on how much you can buy. Um, but you go out and get it from a different source. Who knows? Uh, but well, like I said again, uh, my, my thoughts about Daniel, the way he's very how responsible he is, he would not. It's almost like drinking a beer. I would not drink a beer before I go to work. You know. Uh, there was no marijuana found in the vehicle, no marijuana roaches um, or anything that indicated he actually uh, smoked anything while he's driving or, you know, right. uh, anything that leads towards him doing that before we go to work. Gotcha. OK. And, and that's fair enough, because obviously we, we will be talking about here in a little bit the car itself. And obviously we do have some or you and <laughs> not me, but you have some new developments within this case that we will be getting into in a little bit. Okay. Uh, yeah. But let, let's let's move on a little bit here. Now, I understand that there was an, a, another account that, and this is obviously before he went the, the day he went missing um his one of his good friends roger roger yes. um, i guess it was another co-worker that worked over at the the matrix new world engineering as well said something about him doing some very drastic uh, uh physical appearances or his physical appearance was very drastic from one day he was planning on growing his hair out maybe he was going to start dreading it out or something like that um then then the next day he was suddenly was uh, suddenly he just cut all his hair off right um and there was i guess an incident at a chick-fil-a while when they went to sit down and and daniel's demeanor was drastically different from what he usually is which by the way i mean th- to me this photo right here says a lot to me about who daniel naturally is you know an outgoing fun loving loving life kind of guy and suddenly this friend his account is saying that he wasn't that at all that he his demeanor was completely different um he was very quiet not as talk talkative not as bubbly not as social do you know anything more about that that particular side of that story well, first, uh, uh, Roger, he's uh, definitely a friend of Daniel off the uh, on and off the job. Um, you know, Daniel's a field geologist, meaning that he rarely ever go into the office. So anybody in the office area and, and situation would not you know, be able to assess because field geologists rarely ever come to the office. Uh, but Roger and, and my son, uh, they would hang out after work and things. So I cannot argue the point of what he what was said between. Uh, him and my son, but I can tell you, I think uh, just like how the uh, the police officer Buckeye had my daughter and I in the interrogation room to think of anything that was odd or strange about Daniel. I mean, we sat there for at least about 10, 15 minutes trying to come up with something 
I think that's what ended up happening in this story as well with Roger uh, in certain parts, what I'm saying. Conversation-wise, I cannot say anything outside of that. But as when his hair uh, changing, Daniel always changes hair. I, guys, if I could show you pictures where um, he came to the wedding uh, a year before he went missing and uh, he had the um, uh, braids. The, well, not braids, but look, I, I don't know what they even call them, twists or whatever you call the thing. I'm like, man, what you doing with your hair now? Because he's always changing his hair. You get okay. it down, ball one minute, one day he's uh, growing it out again. And then, you know, so he's always constantly doing that over the years. Yeah. Uh, so that's something when I heard that, I was like, yeah, that's that's just Daniel. He, he swaps uh, hairstyles a lot. Yeah, I mean, if I had hair, I'd be doing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'd be changing it every five seconds. Right. Um. So maybe, yeah, you're you're I right. They just could... kind of tied those things in together. That's what I'm thinking more so. Right. Right. Like, yeah. He, he probably right. just wanted to do something different. Tired of growing it out, and said, "Hey, let me just switch it up." But <laughs> still, his demeanor was a bit odd. Uh, right. According to true, Roger. Right. According right. to Roger, right. that it was just a bit odd, and then. Of course, days later, he went to this site. He was looking off into the distance. Um, he seemed a bit odd. He he apparently was talking about it, it might rain. Then he got into his car and just drove off. So that was around June. That was on June 23rd. Oh, that's, that's correct. That was on June 23rd, 2021. Now, my question is, Obviously, that same day he was it was he was filed as a missing person. That same di- day by Buckeye Police. No, no, no. I won't backtrack on that. Um, I put in a missing person report from South Carolina. Um, okay. No one. Uh, the job did not uh, call to report Daniel missing. Uh, nobody stood out. Um, I had to do due diligence from South Carolina with my daughter, who lives in Arizona at the time. And uh, then I finally, because because we know Daniel, it was over six hours that anybody heard from him. Uh, we couldn't track him down. Of course, wow. I missed a person report in. Okay, so you had to do it all the way from South Carolina. That's correct. To report your son missing That's correct. in Arizona. That's correct. But that was the same day, though, correct? It was, it was that evening. That's correct. Okay, okay. Um, and so within, but that was filed within the Buckeye Police Department on that same day. Well, actually, I went to the uh, Tippy Police Department first. So my son is a resident of Tippy, Arizona. Um, and from there, uh, they pushed me over to the Buckeye Police Department because um, this is the last area they it, people spoke of where he was located, uh, where they seen him last. Uh, so, yes, I did call the Buckeye Police Department. Um, after some time, they had made me wait uh, 12 hours, which actually is against their policy, uh, wait 12 hours, and then I was able to report. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, and that's the frustrating part is the 12 hours, right? Yeah, oh, yes, it was hard. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's that's impossible sometimes or it feels impossible. Um, those kind of, you know, those counting the seconds, right? The, the nanoseconds to you that's actually right. can officially make a report. Um, but he did go missing on Jan- uh, on June 23rd. Now, right. how long did it take for them to actually locate the actual vehicle? Well, it took uh, almost 30 days after uh, Dane, just a couple of days short of 30 days uh, uh, that Dane has been missing. Uh, the vehicle showed up uh, about two, uh, about three miles away, uh, farther into the snoring desert. Uh, it was found by a rancher um, who was out there uh, two days prior. He's in this, uh, that ravine that the vehicle is. The ravine is, is really 20 foot. You guys, we see the pictures. Of course, it looked flat, but actually it's, 20, it's a drop. Uh, and uh, the ranch was in that uh, at that ravine to uh, locate his cattle going through on the 19th uh, on the 17th of, Ju- uh, of uh, J- uh, July and, um, and 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 the vehicle wasn't there so but he came back to see if his cattle was there through there and that's when the vehicle showed up on July the 19th so it was, it was found by a rancher okay so it's found by a rancher but i also understand that by the around that same area a pile of clothes were found as well that he was apparently wearing that's uh, uh, that he was apparently wearing the same day that he went missing. Yeah, allegedly, uh, is uh, Daniel's the, uh, the Buckeye Police Department uh, describe it as Daniel's uh, clothing, everything he's wearing from his underwear down to his socks, uh, and a pile of clothes that was uh, three feet away from the vehicle, um, and you know, uh, a safety vest as well, but three three feet away from the vehicle. Yes, in the pile. Okay, uh, and it, on the clothing, was there any? signs of trauma any blood any anything of that sort according to buckeye police department no no not at all 
so did you ever get a chance to see the, the clothing for yourself with, you know, hold them in your hand and, and observe them yourself? Or are you just or did Buckeye Police Department just give you that information and that's it? Well, what I understand, the Buckeye Police Department collected those items. Uh, of course, they gave it to me um, a, a, a couple of days after uh, they put it in an evidence bag. It's marked for safekeeping. They hand those things over to me. I never to this day touched those items um, personally. Look, uh, you know, look at them that way. My investigator have. I'm sure the Buckeye Police Department, at least I hope they have. Uh, but but um, I did have pictures of those uh, clothing that we have. It's a family. I can't say that uh, the family, we do, do not identify the clothing. We still want some testing done to see if it's Daniel's clothing. Um, my daughter, she see Daniel almost daily, and uh, she don't recognize the clothing. Uh, but nevertheless, that's what we were told, that it's Daniel's clothing. Wow. Okay, so, wow. Wait a second. So you're saying, I'm sorry if I'm... I'm re gonna. I'm gonna repeat what you just said. So, uh, forgive me. I'm just trying to process it myself, and I'm. I'm hoping everybody else who's watching right now is processing what I'm processing as well. So, Buckeye Police Department found a pile of clothing. They're claiming that everything all, all the way is from his shirt all the way down to his socks. Correct. That's right. Even even boxers or <coughs> just or just pants, shirt, socks, shoes. Everything, um, you know, uh, the Buckeye Police Department uh, uh, detective at the time, he said, hey, do your son wear boxes of briefs? I'm like, "How he's a grown man. How would I know that? Right. And he said, well, everything on his body from his underwear down to his socks was found in that pile. Um, uh, that was three feet away from the vehicle. That's correct. Okay. So now, okay. So you guys have seen the clothing. Yourself, yes. yourself and some other members of your family see the clothes and you're saying, and you feel that, it's not his clothing, correct? Uh, you know, I, I can't say it's not. We don't recognize it. We never seen Daniel wear those clothes. Um, I don't know if he went to go buy those clothes and wore them for the first time. We won't know that. Uh, but we can say uh, from his, his my daughter, his sister, who's uh, who has seen him almost every day. Uh, right. You know, she's a, she's had a better eye to what Daniel wears in Arizona because they are there together, and uh, she don't recognize those clothing items as well. I haven't seen them. Uh, but definitely, if she don't recognize him, um, you know, uh, it's not something he always wear, uh, uh, that type deal. So, yes, we have questions about the clothing. That's very odd. OK, yeah, because I'm about to say that that doesn't sound right. That 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 math ain't math. In, because why would somebody strip stark naked after allegedly rolling down into a ravine? Correct. So if the car rolled down into a ravine. And we're going to get into the details and, and the developments and all that. But don't worry, we will get to it. I, I know you're chomping at the bit for that. Um, but why would this person get out of the car? And we'll talk about his, you know, how he was physically and all that, allegedly, like what the theories are here in a little bit. But why would he get out of the car, keep walking, but before he leaves, go it's stripped down and be as naked as the day he was born that, that that's the part that i don't get that's the part i don't get and then of course on top of that you have your even your your own daughter sitting here saying like he wouldn't wear these clothes this is this ain't him um so that a part of me is it screams something else and it's not about y'all it's from the de police department what what are your what are your thoughts on this? It, it just to me the math ain't mathin. Well, you know one thing for sure. Um, I think that it's 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 about the way you look at a case, and you know often often uh, especially with adult men, uh, men in general, um, black men. Um, you know I think the case has not been taken seriously um, because if you was to uh, assess a scene, you would see a crime scene tape. You would have been seeing uh, the markers when they were taking the picture. The picture that you just put up of the vehicle, you don't see the marker. They'll come from straight from the Buckeye Police Department. You don't see markers. Um, there's, um, you know, how they put the little markers there so that when they take pictures, they can say where everything was located. Just in case they realize that this was a crime scene. Uh, you go through those processes. It's called due process of law in a sense. You go through these uh, processes to uh, make sure you're examining the whole crime scene, the whole scene. In the case it turns out to be a crime scene, and this is something high, high in sight, they didn't know at the time, I guess. Uh, but they approached my son's case that way. Uh, the clothing item, it, those are a whole bunch of assumptions. Uh, and, you know, without 
without evidence. So you can't say to a family, say, hey, this is your your, your loved one's clothing. Uh, what is the basis of what is the, um, the evidence of saying this is the clothes? Did you ask us, say, hey, um, do you recognize these clothes? They have yet to this day asked us that. Uh, and we would have told them what we know now. No, we don't recognize the clothing. And that would help to uh, get a law enforcement question and say, hey, look, uh, we need to look deeper into that. Right. Yeah. DNA tests done on the clothing nothing, at all? Nothing done at the scene. Again, uh, you can see the markers not there. They haven't done any uh, forensics on that scene. I have, uh, of course, uh, Detective Biffin explaining to me uh, when that vehicle showed up why he didn't see in the need to do any forensics. Um, and he told me that he didn't see in the need at all to do forensics on that scene. So, um, wait, I'm sorry. Problematic. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Hold on. Time out. I, I don't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Oh, David. that's okay. That's okay. But, but, but wait, wait a second. So you're telling me who said what? Who said he didn't have to? There was no need? Who said uh, that? The detective, the detective of Buckeye Police Department, um, Detective Biffin is his name. He told me that uh, he didn't see any need to do any uh, for He didn't see anything that would say, hey, um, I need to do some forensics um, at the scene, uh, doing a kind of assessment that way. Yes, that's correct. They just collect everything, grab it off the ground, put them in bags, and took off. Yes. And then after that, nothing. Nothing so far, nothing. Well, the, the forensics that have been done on that on that vehicle, uh-huh. uh, two days, uh, two or three days after uh, they returned that vehicle to me, they turned it to me on the on the twentieth of July. Um, I had a meeting with the Buckeye Police Department uh, within that, like a, like the twenty second or something like that. And in that meeting, I, I demanded them to do some type of forensic work, um, asking them to do fingerprinting. Uh, what they end up doing, they say they did the fingerprinting, and they also did the swabbing of the steering wheel and shifter uh, under my request. Um, because if I wouldn't have requested those things, those wouldn't even been done. And to this date, I still don't have a, a nothing back from it. Um, those swabbing or whatever. But the, the thing is, they wouldn't have done anything if I didn't demand it that day. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yes. Yes. You know, and one, oh, go ahead. Uh, go, go no, ahead. no, 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 no. I got, th- I want to, mm, I'm, mm. There's a lot of thought. Sure I don't have anything nice to say right now. Um, <laughs> because the words that want to come out of my mouth, it's filled with a lot of four letter words. Um, and we are going to talk about Buckeye Police Department in in a, in, a, in a little bit as well, um, but that that doesn't make any sense. So as far as assessing the crime scene, okay, the scene in which we're we're assuming is the the place that your son got out of this car, stripped down naked, and then walked into this desert. Um, you're telling me that they didn't do any of their due diligence as far as in using their investigative skills, their the, all the resources that they have to maybe get a better understanding of what happened to your son the moment that car crashed and he got out of the car. They didn't do anything except bag and tag and walk away and say there was no need to do any forensic work on the car or any of the findings that were found around the car as well. That is absolutely insane to me. Now, I can say really quick, um, Go ahead, um, I was please. told they, they did a, uh, a search of the area. Uh, <clears throat> that's what Buckeye Police talk, pop told me. Um, did a search, a search of the area, area utilizing uh, cadaver dogs, uh, search dogs, etc. cetera. Um, you know, um, what, what the question I had when they told me they were doing, utilizing cadaver dogs, I didn't know anything about this stuff until I had to do my own search, but when they told me they were doing um, cadaver dog search, because I've been doing it in my searches as well, um, uh, unless you are uh, assuming that is a crime uh, that somebody passed away from, it, yeah, I get it. Um, you look at the crime, but they didn't. They didn't approach it. Like I say, the approach it seems seriously, but they said they did the search seriously. They used uh, tracking dogs, cadaver dogs, but there was nothing. Nothing. Um, they said they didn't see any, any footprints leading away from the vehicle. Uh, they didn't see uh, the dogs didn't track anybody leaving that scene, you know, that type of deal. Uh, there, was, there was nothing found. Uh, so it goes back to a lot of things that we would be discussing as well uh, mm-hmm. about that scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're we, we going to be talking about some things here in just a minute, y'all. I promise you that. But I'm going through some of the, the basics real quick. And these aren't basics anymore. We, we started going into some real uh, advanced trigonometry here. Um, some some college algebra, if you will. 
um, because this this is some serious stuff, guys. This is the reason why I'm saying please share this, okay? Share this feed, share this show, share this conversation because there's something rotten going on in Denmark here. I'm being real. Something's not right. Please share this, okay? Share, share, share. Hashtag find Daniel Robinson. That's all we need. That's all we're asking for. This is the reason why we're talking about this, because something's not right here. Um, now, when we get into this, because um, there's a couple different things, okay? And, and we are going to come back to Buckeye PD. Trust me. <laughs> oh, trust and belief. We are going to get back into that. But I do want to ask you about the girls. Apparently, Daniel was uh, uh, talking to, well, from what we heard, from what I've heard at least, he was having conversations with a girl, um, maybe a love interest. Um, but then um, I guess there were rumors or at least things that were being said out here in these social media streets that maybe he was, uh, you know, um, heartbroken, um, so on and so forth. And maybe this is what led to him jumping in his car and driving off into his disappearance. Can you expand a little bit on that? Because I feel like that's something that needs to be either confirmed or debunked. Well, you know, a couple of things with that. There's always been a touchy, uh, touchy thing for me. Um, my, my son, Daniel, and I talked, like I said, two days prior. Um, he did mention the young lady. This is the first time I ever heard of uh, Caitlin. Um, he told me uh, bef this before you guys, of uh, course, before he went missing. Uh, he told me that, um, you know, he met these two women off of, um, Instacart. He was driving Instacart. That's the first time you heard about the Instacart because he knew as a father, I'm like, why are you doing Instacart? You know, uh, you need money or, you know, that type deal. Uh, but he did Instacart because, you know, of course, uh, his job was uh, have some uh, time paying his money back that he had to put up front. Um, it's a long story with that as well, the company. Uh, but but he did this cart and he did a, uh, a order for the two young ladies who was uh, the order got messed up dealing with some wine or something he was telling me. And they was really happy that he fits that wine order for them. Uh, they invited him into that that place that night, uh, the two women. And uh, he told me that, of course, he uh, ended up spending the night with, with the Caitlin, um, you know, in that way. And, you know, the thing is, a father, of course, I was really uptight uh, with him, just listening to him telling me this. I'm like, well, you spend a night with a woman that you don't know like that. You're just meeting her. You know, I didn't know they were talking from that point. We just kind of on that date when he met them. Right. And, and you know, like, this, that's the dumbest thing you can do, son. You, you're too smart for that. You know, uh, you don't spend a night at a woman's house. You don't really know. Then I started asking questions as parents would ask, what, who is she, uh, where she works? And he didn't know those answers. Some of the answers I was asking him. Um, but the thing is, um, uh, uh, that's the things I've been hearing about. Uh, this, this that directly from Daniel. There's two women there. Uh, the problem is that we don't know, we don't have no testimony. Buckeye Police Department is hiding the second woman. Um, and, um, um, you know, they have mentioned her, but don't, don't, we don't know who she is. Uh, they, uh, uh, you know, so it, it, they don't have the video record. Because the thing that Daniel told me as well that, that goes along with what I'm hearing out there in the, in the report is that uh, he did go back to because uh, he was telling me that I want to ask him a question. I'm like, hmm, that sounds weird to me. Uh, but he was telling me that he had to go back and retrieve a canopy. It's just something that he utilizes um, out there in the desert um, to keep the sun off of him. And uh, 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 But he went to go retrieve his canopy. He said, hey, my canopy is in her backyard. And uh, she had told me that I can go back and get it. You know, So he went to go get his canopy for because he had to take it to work. Uh, and, you know, in my mind, I didn't ask him, but I was like, hmm, what y'all doing in the backyard? You know, using the house of the canopy at night, you know. Uh, but the thing is, um, uh, uh, I did hear a lot of stories about him being heartbroken. Daniel Daniel never mentioned one thing I want to say, too, as well. Uh, in the report, the Buckeye Police Department held that I said that Daniel was in love with a woman he didn't know. I never told the Buckeye Police Department that. Um, they had my daughter and I sitting in the interrogation room, too think of anything we think that's odd and strange about Daniel. It's hard. My daughter even brought up something that happened a week or so before he went missing. Uh, he came over her house and staring off at the wall. I mean, I stare off, but just come up with anything we can come up with. And they utilize that to go along with the mental state. Uh, also, the, the the love interest, my son had never used the word love in our conversation about this woman. He never, he'd say he, he, he asked me questions about her, uh, what he, what I think. 
uh, as we always do as fathers and son do, but he never ever mentioned the word love or anything like, hey, I'm in love with this woman or that type deal. So I do right. hear that in, in the public's eye uh, where they feel the story. I'm telling you from that report, it seemed like it been uh, uh, word I want to use, been, been given a story, given a story where, oh, this is the reason why he probably did this to him. So he offered himself or something. He was depressed and he was in love with a woman he didn't know and that kind of stuff like that. So that's a problem. Problematic yeah. for me, right? Okay, so real quick, um, because I got I got a couple questions. Yes. Uh, okay, so he hooked up with this girl, all that. Right. Why haven't Why haven't they? So they did they talk to the girl that he hooked up with, and and why haven't they? Why are they protecting or Why hasn't the second girl that was there that met Daniel? Why hasn't she stepped forward and, and and spoken out? What are they hiding or why are they holding her back from being able to speak? Are Actually, are they holding her back or is she refusing to speak? That's the question I have for you. Well, you know, um, I, when, I, when I was told, because <clears throat> I'm constantly in touch with the Buckeye Police Department in those early days, when I was told from the officer that I was talking to that night, he went over, uh, where he called over to uh, speak with uh, uh, Caitlin and uh, um, and. Uh, uh, you know, just like he he reached out to them. I uh, heard they went over to her place. They reached out to her. Um, just one, one specific person. And that's the reason why, because we mentioned um, her name. Um, we didn't know uh, the other young lady's name. Uh, we learned that, uh, uh, you know, because Daniel, he didn't even tell me the other young lady's name. Uh, but, yeah, they reached out to her. They reached out to her. But this other person who was an eyewitness, because she was there too, and I did express that to the Buckeye Police Department, I just still, to this day, I still don't understand the reason why they're not hearing um, her from her as well. Uh, we guys already know they allowed uh, Caitlin to upload her text messages into uh, evidence.com. That's something you never do. Uh, that's a hearsay type uh, information. Um, you guys can look at the details of that and see how uh, those things, the way we look at it, has been altered. Uh, it doesn't make, match his, his phone records, for instance. So, so the thing is, um, uh, you know, uh, we're still trying to figure out what happened with this other, this other lady because I know that's an eyewitness is a key element to this case. Uh, if they want to add in uh, Caitlin's story, yeah, because I I feel like that would be crucial to hear a, a little bit more of that. And of course, there's the other question of if w did she have another, you know, did she have a boyfriend? Was there a previous relationship that she had before? Right. Then maybe this is a disgruntled ex lover or a disgruntled right. lover anyway. Um, because you know, I understand that there's the hookup culture that exists out here, um, and some people get some people can really get in their feelings. Uh, right. Definitely can get in their feelings if they find out somebody else is hooking up with the girl that they're hooking up with. And of course, not trying to sit here and throw out all this, you know, rumor and try to throw out trash rumors or anything, but it is a question to throw out there or, or to just to look into and, and, and ask out loud. Right. And right. when we think out loud, well, that could be an Avenue, right? That's right. The other question I have for you, Dan, with, with Daniel is, did he own a firearm? No, he did not. No, he did not. I wish he did, but no, he did not. Uh, Daniel never owned any firearms. Um, or uh, any weapons? No, no, not at all. Okay. Not at all. Okay. Um, because obviously, you know, as we, we're we hearing these stories and all that, because it's still, no matter what, there has been no body found. There has been, I understand that there has been body parts or bones that have been found, but none of them have been uh, identified as Daniel. That's great. Um, and again, still, I, I, I still am <coughs> wrapping around in my mind how this is. He gets out of the car. Somehow he gets out of the car. He strips down naked and then walks off. And I feel that. And, I, you know, I hear a lot of people out here saying, oh, yeah, you know, uh, he could have walked out and into uh, into a street and maybe gotten hit by a car or something like that. But there would be remains left somewhere, right? And I hate right, to say right. that so graphically to you, um, but at the same time, it just seems a bit odd. It just seems a bit odd. Now, let's talk about his job. Was there anything that was going on within the Matrix, um, the Matrix New World Engineering 
that could be some possible red flags. Was he having, was he butting heads with people at work? Was there maybe a project that uh, he didn't agree with or he had information on something that was confidential that maybe he spoke out about? Uh, was there anything within his job that could maybe catch him into some sort of trouble? Well, you know, uh, in my investigation, um, of course, I'd look at every avenue of, of motive and things like that. Uh, I can't say with Daniel's job, um, one thing, like I said, with the Instacart, he did Instacart because he uh, would have to uh, upfront pay for uh, everything on the job, any job that he go to, they assign him to. And whatever costs he, he incurred from that, he had to do uh, put in a expense report. And that takes some time uh, for them to reimburse him. So, of course, he don't want to be late for his bills. Uh, that's what I was, I was told by Daniel. He took the Instacart job. Um, but that, that's one of the personal things that with Daniel, with the job, he was very dissatisfied with, with Matrix New World at that point. Mm. Um, Daniel definitely uh, is a, a activist. Many people don't know that. Uh, he's been in several protests, with George Floyd and so, some of the others. Uh, he's been interviewed by local um, news. Um, he, he speaks out about uh, police injustice. So, so those are things that, <clears throat> excuse me, I have to... I always look at uh, as a motive, but also the biggest part is um, with this case that people don't talk about much. Uh, the project that Daniel went out to, he had two well site projects, uh, one off of Rada Way uh, in Arizona, that's off of I-10, both is off of I-10, um, and the other one is off of Sun Valley Parkway. Those two well areas are connected to each other. Um, what, it, what Daniel does as a scientist is to uh, determine if these groundwaters could produce 100 years of water that sustain the community. That's something that is by law in Arizona. A community cannot be built if uh, there's not enough water or groundwater to support that community. Um, as you guys know, the area that Daniel was went missing from, um, that area was, was being tested. Um, Daniel was out there to test that, that, uh, that well with Ken uh, to, to, to determine those things, if uh, those wells could produce at least 100 years of water. Uh, of course, hindsight now, we know it doesn't. Uh, the Howard Hughes Corporation, uh, which is also with Bill Gates uh, and some of those big higher billionaires, uh, building a, a city called uh, Culture Vellus, uh, but it's a big, uh, powerful, uh, a smart city is what they call it. And the smart city cannot be built because there's not enough groundwater. Uh, we do know that the uh, the governor, the old governor, we have a new governor in Arizona now, uh, the old governor uh, was hiding that report. And that report came out in the, the month that Daniel was out there uh, in June when he went missing of 2021. But they, they hit that report uh, until the new re new uh, governor came in and found it very uptight because the community was asking for this report for a long time. Uh, and we found out once the report was out there uh, that this, indeed, the area that Daniel was uh, doing his work at, it does not support uh, a community being built there. So this this community uh, will bring in billions and billions of dollars. Buckeye is one of the fastest growing uh, cities in America. And, you know, so I look at those things as sometimes modus as well. So we kind of look at uh, those areas to, to explore. Whoa. Yes. So, whoa. So he might have had some information that could have paused the production or could have paused the the movement of this smart city, as you just said, am I correct? Yeah, yeah, and that's like I said, Daniel's a, a person. I know Daniel. If there's something ain't right, he's going to say something about it. Now, one right. thing that stood out as well uh, that we don't speak about, uh, I was able to get Daniel's phone from the Buckeye Police Department, and in that phone, I found that Daniel took pictures of logs uh, from the first well site. That's something he just didn't do for whatever reason. This time, he took these pictures. Pictures. I don't know what it means. I'm trying to get somebody to look at those. Uh, who can who can disciple those uh, geological graphs and all kind of stuff? Anyway, uh, he took these pictures and and uh, he kept that in his phone that day when he went missing. And uh, I, I just don't know what that means. I'm mm -hmm. not trying to trying to put this together like that, but that's some of the things I'm exploring as well. Uh, we'll say, hey, look, this is the evidence that this groundwater. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, this this area cannot produce enough water out there. Hmm. That is very interesting indeed. Yeah. Uh, wow. Okay. Um, does anybody else know about this information? Or did you figure this out by yourself? Yes, I figured out, figured out by, uh, you know, I was given that phone uh, by the Buckeye Police Department from the scene. The phone was found on the scene. 
Right. Uh, of course, I we go. I'm sure we gonna talk about that part. Things that was missing off that phone, but right. um, that's when I was able to go through Daniel's phone um, and get those informations out. Uh, so those 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 things I'm looking in from my investigative standpoint. Wow. So th- this is this the things that you understand that you that's grabbed right. yourself. That's right. Because I do also understand that you do have your own PI, your own private investigator involved in this as well, which of course is unearthing some new developments in this in this whole case. Um, so let's get into it, shall we? Let's get into <laughs> okay. let's get into the meat and potatoes. What we're all waiting for, of course. Now I understand that there's some new evidence or some new developments in the case of where or at least what happened or what could possibly have happened to Daniel Robinson. And a lot of it has to do with this cell phone. A lot of this has to do with his, the car. Um, and of course we're going to bring, bring, uh, come in or get into that here in just a second. One other thing I do realize um, is that real quick, his Instagram was erased. Yeah, if I'm yeah. correct, photos on his Instagram were erased. But this Everything, was, this yeah. happened after he went missing. Correct. And this, this is the thing with the family. We're trying to see if it happened the day of he went missing or the day after. Uh, we we're trying to, because I think this was the time that we actually looked at it. Because, of course, um, on the day he went missing, we started looking at his uh, his pages. So it's out of the day where he went missing or the day after he went missing that we noticed uh, that his pictures and things were uh, deleted off his uh, Instagram account. Um, and, and, you know, uh, that was problematic for us because that's all we saw was at first all the pictures and everything going. Daniel loved all his pictures and stuff. And then mm-hmm. his profile picture itself, I think, if I'm not mistaken, was actually taken off as well. I mean, these photos alone, I mean, these are amazing photos. Um, and uh, I would want to share these on my Instagram. These ain't even mine, but I'd want to share them. <laughs> yes, yes. These are fire. So uh, it, it is still very surprising. Um, hearing that he disappears and either the day of or the day after or sometime after he went missing, his IG, some of his IG photos were just poof. They just got erased. But yeah, his cell were, phone, yeah. sorry, say, say that again, I'm sorry. Yeah, all of them, all of, everything, yes. Everything was deleted. That's oh, correct. everything was deleted. Everything, that's right. Whoa, 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 whoa. I, I From my understanding, I thought it was just like five or six photos, but oh, every, no, his no. whole profile right. was deleted. Wow. Right. You know, the profile was still there, but the, the pictures was deleted off. Correct. Right. Everything on the profile erased. That's right. insane as well. Um, now, okay. We we got to get into this because I, I know there's more things within this cell phone. And there's something about these searches that he was doing or at least Googling on his phone before his disappearance. Can we dive into that a little bit? These are some, yeah, sure. some of the sure. new developments into this, into the uh, investigation in this case, guys. So something about him searching on his phone, on his Google, what, what he was entering into Google for, for his searches. Can we talk about that? Can you expand on that a little bit? Sure. Sure. Um, well, that's some of the information I have received from the, um, you know, of course, the Buckeye Police Department did directly uh, contact me and give me those new things they came up with with the uh, search history uh, on Dan's phone. Um, but I can say uh, just hearing those things uh, about the search history, uh, things like uh, I think it was one uh, Tempe explosion, uh, one was something else out of other. Uh, yeah, I, I was asking, I, I definitely want to d- deep dive into those uh, search histories. If that's something that Daniel actually did himself. Or was someone else on his phone? I'm not sure. Those, those right. are things that we still have questions about on my investigation. So when you say Tempe, Arizona explosion, what do you think that means? I mean, is it was there a was there a recent explosion there during that time in Tempe, Arizona? What, what, what do you think he, he was googling that for? I'm not sure, and that's what I would think in my mind. Say, hey, like like you said, is it something that he was looking at? He said, hey, I heard somebody say it was an explosion in Tempe. Uh, he lives in Tempe, uh, but as in a person to say, hey, I'm gonna go explode something. I think that's the narrative that the Buckeye Police Department are putting out there. Um, no, that's not Daniel's uh, character. He's not that kind of person. Uh, uh, like uh, like an he don't, of... he don't own like you said a weapon. He don't even own a weapon. Uh, right. So where we get in thing at to. Uh, explode anything so it don't make right. sense to me so to me it'd be more towards he's looking up a story uh that you probably heard of or something 
Gotcha. Uh, you, you, in other words, you're trying to say like they were thinking Buckeye Police Department were trying to put out a narrative that maybe he was up to no good, like an act right. of terror, an act of terrorism. Right. You know, and that's that goes along with everything else that uh been mm. happening with the uh, Buckeye Police Department when it comes to in terms of uh, uh, putting this this narrative out about Daniel's character. And it's, it's hard for me as a father. Um, you know, I can't say for every father, but I can't I, I can say for mine. I didn't have a father growing up. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I promised my children they gonna always have a father. Uh, but I was I'm, I was there from the day one. Daniel was born. I was a single parent uh, for six years with his siblings, him and his siblings. And, uh, and if anybody know uh, a lot about Daniel and his character and the way that he is, uh, the way he think, it, it would be myself, his mother, of course, but myself. And and you know, uh, you know, just just the whole idea that uh, the narratives that have been put out there, he's in love with a woman he didn't know, or uh, you know, he's he's uh, off of himself because he's so depressed and things like that. Or he he joined a monastery to become a monk because he wanted to be away from his family. Those things are not something something that um, uh, is typical of, of our family dynamics. So right. that's the reason why um, I have to fight against those narratives uh, narratives that the Buckeye Police Department put in through their reports. Now, it's I, unnecessary things they put in the report that would draw those narratives. Gotcha. I mean, because we do understand that uh, according to Roger, one of his good friends, he was having a conversation with him at Chick-fil-A about his relationship right. with God. So right. a, a part of me does make me wonder, or like in a way he was like, oh, you need to get right with God. He was saying allegedly this is what was this is what Roger was saying. Daniel was saying to Roger, basically saying, you need to get right with God. You need to find your relationship with God. But outside of that. It, you it, would Daniel ever go? I mean, I, it's so wild for me to even ask this, but do, I'm sorry. But would you ever think that your son would ever crash his car, strip naked and go find a monastery? No, that's, that's, that's not Daniel. Um, it, like I said, we have a close knit family. Daniel can tell us anything, um, you know, no matter what it is, our, our family, we know, Hey, look, you got there's some things I can discuss as well, but uh, you know, we talk about uh, talk about a lot. I'd say as a family, he, he wanted if he wanted to become a monk and join a monastery, he would have just literally just told us, "Hey, look, Dad, I decided." You know, he asked my opinion. Of course, I decided as a man, I want to uh, be a monk. I'm like, man, that sounds wow. I mean, what's that all about? Uh, but you know, ultimately, he know that what I would say. Hey, look, man, you're a grown man. I support you, and you know, let me help you with that. You know, if that's what you want to do, let's let's talk about how you can best get into what you're trying to do. But the thing is, uh, uh, it would be a secret or something. Uh, Daniel will hold back from the family uh, and, and just go off and, and, and do it on his own. No, it, it's some things he, he definitely would have discussed first. Yeah. OK. And fair enough. Fair enough. Um, because obviously uh, this story, um, just like the Petito story. OK. And shout out to the Petito Schmidt family. Because yes. they've been they've been doing amazing work as, yes, as well, yeah, keeping yeah. this story alive as well. Um, it, it obviously goes off the rails, you know, with the investigation, with the stories, the rumors, et cetera. Things just go off the rails. Um, so it's good to have cer these certain things debunked. But we do need to talk about this other piece. And I feel like this is a big piece of information. Uh, at least I do, because I know that there was a quote unquote eyewitness. A, and from what he was saying, he was a former fe federal law enforcement officer that was one of the last people to see Daniel out in the desert. Okay. Now, can we talk about what this eyewitness said he saw before we go into this breaking information here? What yes. was this law enforcement, this former federal agent, what did he say that he saw when he ran into Daniel in the desert? Well, first, I want to say, you know, when I first heard from this uh, this, this gentleman, um, uh, I was excited to be honest with you. Uh, I did not believe Ken's story, his take of anything at the uh, the last person that seen my son. Uh, it, it, to me, it was breaking news. Uh, this gentleman, he came up to one of the searches. Um, he introduced himself, like you said, as a federal law enforcement officer. Um, I, I can be honest; I was very judgmental of, of his appearance. He didn't seem like a um, in a, anything that says law enforcement, uh, but nevertheless, I sent him to my investigator. My investigator 
Um, I let him work with that to see if indeed he's who he say he is. Uh, later they told me he he was, and he came back to tell me the story. Uh, what he because I wanted to hear. He kept saying, "Hey, I want you to tell you what I saw." Mm -hmm. uh, so once he got uh, vetted out by my investigator, then I allowed myself to listen to his story. Um, he told me that um, uh, that he seen Daniel on that day, uh, roughly around one o'clock um, mm -hmm. last. But he said uh, he saw him two, two times that day. He saw him through the scope of his rifle, him and his children was out there target practicing. Uh, he saw uh, Daniel's vehicle out through the scope of his rifle. I didn't like hearing that, but he, he did say he seen the vehicle through the scope of his rifle um, from a far distance uh, near near the Hacienda River. Uh, then he said later on, like I said, around one o'clock, he seen him uh, near the wagon of wash on the, on the riverbank. Mm. And so he said, hey, he seen the car twice. So he said he wanted to approach the car. Uh, so he was, as he was approaching the car, he said he saw the driver's door open. Uh, and he could see the legs, but he couldn't really see Daniel. Then, he, then Daniel come out from the car. Uh, and he was standing there and they were speaking to each other. Uh, but he didn't realize that Daniel had only was missing his right hand because he was standing the way that he could see at first until he stood away from the door. Um, that's when he said he seen him um, with the one hand uh, missing. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is trying to go away. Uh, but he also said that he uh, had the conversation with him and his son, uh, his children. Uh, he's, he, he said uh, Daniel's very nice to his children. Um, of course, I, I've been jotting in and asked him, say, hey, do you smell anything? No, no, no weed or nothing. I didn't smell anything, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but he said he's very nice. Um, he said that um, um, he asked, asked Daniel, if, if um, he knew where the proper place for him to target practice with his children. And he said, Daniel told him, he said, hey, you know, you go, um, he pointed out to the area, he said, hey, you don't shoot in this area because we are working in this area, uh, but you go shoot over in this, this area over there. Um, right. So he said he was able to, um, to, Daniel was able to give him directions to uh, where him and his children can go target practice. So th those are things that we heard at, at the beginning. And of course, right. I was very happy to hear those. Obviously, and you and you heard that information. Uh, yeah. We all heard that information. We all heard that eyewitness account from this former federal agent, former uh, <coughs> federal me. law enforcement officer. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what he was claiming to be. Right. But now there's been new information as of recently saying otherwise. In fact, this guy is not. Right. A former law enforcement officer. He's a what now, David? Uh, he's actually have a, a, a crime sheet uh, to make a little criminal, criminal history. Um, he's definitely not a law enforcement officer. I found that out um, in 2021. Uh, um, first of all, that's based on uh, my my doubt of his his um, his assessment. When I start after I listened to a story, I started looking into things that um, didn't make sense to me. My investigator came out with a report uh, that put the first the accident that happened, the first accident on Dane's vehicle happened around one o'clock because the guy said he seen Dane around one. So once he heard that, he changed the story. Once he changed the story, say ten o'clock that morning, that threw up red flags for me. And then I started deep diving into uh, who he was and things like that. I did not know that he wasn't a law enforcement officer at this point. I was just getting a lot of information from him. But we did have an internet uh, sleuth, um, what you call, I guess, the name. I hope I was using the right word. Yeah. Uh, that was actually actually um, digging into him as well. And then he found a uh, a rap sheet. Um, he started posting it all over social media. That's when I they, they gave that to me. Uh, it was embarrassing on my part because I was age, I was out in, in the media uh, speaking about the second person who's uh, seen Daniel. Um, yeah. But then it turned out he's not a law enforcement um, agent. Uh, and his story wasn't true. Full on lies, guys. A full on fabrication of meeting Daniel twice while going target practicing with his kids. This man has a rap sheet. He's an ex convict. Okay. He has committed crimes here, y'all. But he went out and he lied. And I remember you came onto the show. And we did talk about that piece of information, the right. eyewitness account from a former a police officer, okay? And now we're finding out that that all was a fabrication. That right. was all one fat-ass lie, guys. This is insane. See, there's a lot of issues I'm having here, guys. And I'm sure I, I, I'm not living it. David is. You are David. 
and I can only imagine the amount of frustration that is probably coursing through your veins uh, when you hear information like that. When you hear that, okay, you're leaning on this information. It doesn't matter, you know, how you initially feel about the guy right off the right. bat. Most of the time, right. your gut is really right. And in this instance, yeah, your your gut was right, but you're still leaning on it for hope. And then all of a sudden, this person just destroys it by being a straight up liar. It, uh, it, it blows my mind that this is an actual convicted felon, but he steps out and says all these lies. And it makes you wonder, why did he do that? Why would he come out of his way to say that stuff? It, it, yeah, motive. Yeah, and that's, that, that's motive, motive as well. Um, I still see him as a uh, suspect. Uh, the Buckingham right. Police Department, um, um, according to the new report, they rule him out, um, anything he say, but that's, that's the end of the story for them. It's not for me. Um, anytime somebody out there uh, impersonating a law enforcement officer, they should be put behind jail, for, first of all. Uh, the other part is, exactly. um, of course, he, he literally, um, uh, you know, like I say, it was embarrassing. I, I was really uh, uptight with my investigator at the time because he must not have vetted the story uh, as he said he did. I was on a family press conference in the public um saying that he's a federal law enforcement officer i look at look at my if you guys watch that video you can see me look at my investigator and say look at him are you sure basically is what i was saying to him he said yeah yeah federal law enforcement so i was comfortable with saying that to the public and um but i had my doubts that's why you see me, the way i looked at him i still had my doubts but of course he's my investigator and i went with it um i did talk to the buckeye police department three months ago um uh, and they asked me what i thought i gave them all the information i had about this gentleman Mm-hmm. Um, why I thought he's a, uh, why I think he's a suspect, why I didn't believe a story. Um, so you guys can see in the report, they reflected that now. Um, and, you know, but I knew this stuff ever since 2021. Um, and like I said, it, he's a suspect as well, uh, for me, because one thing I had, a, one of the persons came on to my live and she asked a question, say, well, Mr. Robson, um, you said this guy said that he, uh, Daniel gave him directions to a location, um, where, where to go target practice with his children. But Daniel never been out there, so how can he give him directions to a place he never been? And that was another red flag. I'm like, well, you're right. That don't make sense. You cannot give direction to a, a place where you shoot out there in that, that Sonoran Desert if you never have been out there ever in your life, you wouldn't know. Uh, so that was the man's story. Uh, Daniel gave him directions. So those type deals. Um, and again, again, we have some little indications about other um, motives and other uh, suspects that right. guy uh, they push away to the side uh, and and dismiss those things um, as it just oh it's just a story and they just move on. But no, we need to deep dive into those things as well. Uh, we're going to look into that too, and we're going to talk about that here in just a second. So keep that in your in your mind for one second, right. real quick, because I even myself I want to know what was this this man convicted of? What was this this man who was claiming to present himself as a ex police officer? Okay, what was he convicted of? What was his rap sheet? Do you have any like a little bit of that you can pepper in here really quick for us yeah. and, and, and the uh, fam that's watching right now? Yeah, just a little. Um, I don't want to go the whole full details, but I can say uh, he had a rap sheet. One is also impersonating law enforcement in the past. Uh, the other part is uh, he has a, a still self uh, rap sheet about uh, marijuana. Um, you know, mm. and that's the reason why, you know, I kind of look at those two things correlation together. Daniel is a, uh, a weed smoker, smoker, and this guy, he's an advocate for, uh, marijuana. I guess, it, especially before, uh, Arizona became a legal state, uh, to, to have marijuana. Uh, and you know, this guy was, uh, uh, uh convicted of, of trying to, I think something with the, dealing with dispensaries and things like that. Uh, so it's always been about, um, the drugs itself. Uh, is what his convictions was about. Okay, so a lot of his convictions were from uh, drug-related charges, but were right. there anything with weapons, any weapon charges right. or anything it's of that sort? Yes. Okay, so they, there is show, like of a violent nature or just having possession of weapons? You see what, what I'm I, saying? What I read is more, I think it's more of the possession part of things. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. Now I'm I'm wondering, have they re- brought this guy back in to to investigate him a little bit more? Why would he lie about this 
uh, and go out of his way to say something like the, to, to make and fabricate this in the first place. To me, that says to me that there needs to be more of an investigation or more of a look into this individual because he clearly knows something. Right. To me, it feels like he clearly knows something else. And by him stepping forward is almost him not being able to handle the guilt if that makes any sense so he's in a way saying like i know stuff but i don't i don't know just something about it doesn't seem right are you guys investigating more into this individual right now i tried um one thing you're right uh people do uh if we can think about it a lot of times in, in criminal cases uh people who is involved they show up with things like your searches they try to be real helpful. And the reason why, because they can know what's really going on. Are you really catching up with me? Um, so those are some of the things I looked at as well. But yes, I, I'm constantly still trying to put things together. I was very hurt hurt by uh, the release of this guy's rap sheet out on uh, social media because it caused him to shut down and don't, don't speak to me as well. Uh, he always been, from that point, been a suspect, but he was at least talking to me and I had uh, conversations with him where I can get uh, as much information as I can. As in deep diving, I was hoping the Buckeye Police Department would, would have been deep diving. I did, like I said, talk to Detective Biff three months ago. He was asking me what I think and getting everything, uh, what I think about the guy and everything I have. Um, I gave it to him to let him know, hey, this is the reason why I look at him as a suspect. Mm -hmm. um, but as in bringing him back in, there was no indication that I'm bringing him back in to interrogate. I want, I want, to, I want to see somebody interrogated. I want to see him interrogated. I want to see Ken interrogated. The last person that said they seen someone, those people need to be interrogated. To find out that their stories are actually and what what their motives are and things like that. Right. So let's let's tap in on that really quick. Let's yeah. talk about because I agree. Bring in that man. Uh, I, I I don't even know his name to be honest. But what is his name? The the man who was impersonating an officer. Oh, That's yeah. Awesome. Uh, uh, yes. Now my mind will go on blank. Billy. Billy is the name. That's right. Billy. OK, That's so right. Billy needs to get his butt dragged in and right. interrogated until he starts squawking. Um, but the other the other thing, let's talk about Ken really quick, because I know I read that report right before we, we brought you on, because he is one of the last people to see him see your son get into a car and allegedly drive off. What is it about Ken's? Uh, eyewitness account that sparks questions in you to to want <coughs> to bring him in to in be interrogated even more. Well, his story don't first of all I don't match the timeline. Um, the story details don't don't make sense. He's changed his stories constantly. Anytime people keep changing their stories, uh, it, it, it right throw a flash for me. Uh, the first officer Cruz that gave the initial story to me told me exactly what he said. Um, um, that's the first officer who took my son's case. And he's oh, hmm. so you're telling me that Ken's story has changed. So what oh, yeah, I read, so what I read, right. uh -huh. so what I read to you was a, is a different version than right. what you or what I read in the beginning of the show is is a different account than what you initially heard. Yeah, it, it's, the details of those uh, stories it has a lot of changes in it. Uh, like I said, also Cruz uh, said, uh, you know, the first thing the person says is really sharp in their mind. <clears throat> and they tell you exactly what happened happened at the time. Uh, he told Officer Cruz that Daniel, he, he and Daniel made at the well site around 9 o'clock, at 9 o'clock that morning. And Daniel left at 9.15, right? Uh, but then he told the second officer that it was at 9.30 that they, they uh, arrived at the site. And that was after, you guys. Uh, it's a couple of things, a couple of things with that. Uh, like I said, the story, the story changed. That was a problem for me. Um, the first thing I did when I came out of Arizona is to, you know, as a father, here I am, a father, hearing a story from law enforcement say, hey, this guy said your son was there at 9 o'clock. He was looking all in his eyes and all kind of crazy crap, and he weighed off and disappeared. So I wanted to hear this guy. The first person I went to go see when I got my foot on Phoenix is Ken. I, I made an arrangement with Matrix New World to get him reached out into his company, uh, which the crazy part is he's, he's still working at that well site after day with missing every day. Um, hmm. and, and I, I met, met him out there on Sun Valley Park with the same way that Daniel did, right on the shoulder, shoulder of the road. And um, I went to look at this man's eye. You know, I'm a grown man. I said, hey, look, I need to look at this man's eye. He tell me, I want him to look at my eyes and tell me something I, I know my son wouldn't do, right? Mm -hmm. Look at my eyes. And so I was able to finally get to that point. And um, I talked to Ken, but he changed the story then. Um, I had eyewitness there too, my daughter and also another young lady. 
who was recording and, and picture. I also took a uh, contemporary note. Excuse me, my voice going away. You good? Took take notes. your time, bro. Uh, yeah, I took notes and everything to make sure I did not miss anything that Kim was saying. But he told me the story exactly, almost like it was written down. He told me exactly uh, the story how Officer Cruz told me. I mean, word from word, verbatim, verbatim. That's what it sounded like, right? And then after a while, I did this technique because I'm a military guy. Uh, we have techniques that we utilize for uh, some other things I just have to do uh, or know about in the military. Yeah. Uh, but you befriend people to get them to talk a little bit more, right? In the sense, it's a little tactic. But anyway, I did that, and um, he started getting loose and started telling me more details. Ken said things like, um, you know, we, I, I stayed, I, I, first he said, hey, if I knew your son mannerism, I would have known something might, probably wasn't right. Right. And then he said, uh, you know, but when he said we didn't go look for Daniel, right immediately, he said Daniel drove off. Because uh, according to the story that you read, it, it's, it was later on the day that he said he went out to go look. But this this story he told me, when Daniel took off, he went to go follow him, right? He stayed left of the tracks so he didn't disturb those tracks because he said, I stayed left of these tracks because of, I, I didn't want to disturb them because I know law enforcement going to come looking and this story is going to go national. And that's Wait. exactly what he said. Yes. Wait, 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 I'm sorry. Wait a second. Yes, yes. What? So you're oh, yeah. yes. Because I'm, okay, fam, I'm, I'm learning this just right now, too. Yes. Okay, yes. hold on. Hold on. So, because he says in the, 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 the article, the, the, the quote that I have just read before the show, that your son got in the car, waved bye-bye, and drove off. There's yeah, nothing this, yeah. in the account that he says where... He says that he jumped into a car and drove off after him. Right. So, so, but then he, you're telling me he stayed left of the yeah. track. So he didn't so that, disturb them. Right. So he didn't disturb him because he right. felt like he felt in his bones. He felt in his bones that this was going to be a national story. He already oh, yeah. knew oh, yeah. that this was going to be a national story before your son was even reported missing. What? Right. And, and that's the thing I'm saying, you guys. You got to, when I tell you the story, this, <laughs> that problems matter to me because law enforcement would not they, they they select the what they want to put in their report for you guys. Uh, but yeah, he stayed left of the tracks. He said because um, he knows the uh, uh, police would come looking and this thing would go national. Uh, he said when he got to the T junction, he said those those tire tracks went over to the right. They're going out west. So he said this is the story he's telling me. He he followed those tracks out west. He came up to a gate. Uh, he got his vehicle um, and opened that gate. And he said he went another mile. And then once he, um, he got another mile or so, he got his vehicle. He started walking around. He got up on a higher uh, elevation to look to see if he could see him from a distance. And he said he couldn't see him, but he said he was following these tracks. He said, so what he did is he took the uh, some red paint and he sprayed some rocks with red, uh, uh, with, uh, sprayed the rocks with red uh, spray paint. So law enforcement know where to come and where to look. But you know, I'm going to tell you the story, you guys. And this is just the problem for me with uh, Buckeye. When, you, when I actually did my due diligence, I followed his story verbatim. I got in my vehicle. I did live um, before um, at the scene. When, once after my search was one day, I stayed out there, uh, did a live for you all, for everybody in the public. Look, I followed this man's story. It's impossible with the trail. It's impossible to stay left of the tracks, first of all. The other part is I showed people the tracks that's still there. There's no rain washing away these tracks, not in that desert terrain because of the way the, the dirt is made. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why you say he was able to distinguish which was Daniel's, which was nobody else. Because he's talking about everybody else's tracks was washed away except for Daniel somehow, magically. Um, but the thing is, if you mm -hmm. listen to that story where he went west, got his car, opened the gate, go another mile, got his car and go up on an elevation. And when you follow that story, guess where it'll take you? It takes you where the vehicle eventually going to be found, literally, and and so those things have bothered. So Buckeye is saying, "Hey, this vehicle is here at ten o'clock. Uh, can't know anything about. He knows something about that because his story take you there um, straight from that well site. So so that's the things that that stood out to me to this date. And 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 you and also just so I can understand, and I'm repeating this for all the people in the nosebleed seats that are listening here. So you're telling me that he drove left of the tracks, right? You're correct. No, tell me. But, but you didn't see any tracks on the left, did you? It's impossible to uh, stay left of the tracks because the the, 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 the the terrain, if you watch the video I, I put out there, mm -hmm. it, it's so narrow, uh, it's impossible to stay left of the track. You can't drive on a brush. 
um, it's too, too narrow. You won't be able to do it. It's impossible, first of all. But he said he was a, he, he done that. He told me stay left of the tracks. Uh, so that was an impossible task. That's another red flag for me. Correct. Oh, my Lord. What? Okay. Sorry, that's that's a lot to process, y'all. Oh, yes. That's yes. a big, that's a lot to process. Um, okay. Let's get into the car, shall we? All right. Because there's some information about the cars, about the car, y'all. Now, outside of what we just heard, which, by the way, is mind-blowing. My mind is blown right now, okay? Um, because now, now I feel, yeah, they need to start looking into Ken. Kenny yeah, Ken, yeah. Kenny Ken, they need to be looking into Kenny Ken like right now because that does not make any sense, any sense unless he was walking it, unless he was riding a bike or a motorcycle. Right. Right. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. How could he do that? He basically, it's too narrow. There's no way he would have been able to drive on the left side. But you're telling me all the, the tracks, the only tire tracks that were in there led to where the car is, was or was at that time which is right here right, right. this car now yeah, i understand yeah. that there's new developments and new information in from inside the car can you explain and let us know a little bit about that as well well um well the thing is uh if if you guys know that the first initial just look at this scene the buckeye police department felt like hey daniel just pretty much uh, had a brain injury spread his clothes off gotten eaten by animals, something or join a monster to become a monk. Of course, their theory and looking at the scene, of course, from my 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 point of view, caused me to get a private investigator because that, that story just don't make sense to me that Buckeye pulled out. Uh, but once uh, uh, my investigator came on the scene, <clears throat> I was going to collect the vehicle because the vehicle was already given to me on the 20th of July. The vehicle was found on 19th. Buckeye Police Department threatened me if I didn't get out there. Compound is going to have to the away. And it's going to charge me storage fees. But I was able to convince them to hold it for three days. Um, when I sent my investigator to come pick that vehicle up, um, they was ready to release it until. Uh, they, they, two things my investigator told me when he got there, he asked them for um, the black data, the, the black box data. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> he asked them for the black box data. And they gave it to him. They said they wasn't, re they wasn't investigating the case. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no investigation. So they gave him the black box data. Uh, but at the same time, they asked him what he's going to do with the vehicle. And he told him, hey, you know, I'm having the infotainment system pull out of there, send to California for analysis. Uh, once he said that, the Buckeye Police Department flipped out. They said, hey, look, um, no, they talked to the attorneys or something out of the other. They said that I would have to sign for the vehicle. So they called me, had me come out to Buckeye to sign, sign, you know, sign for the vehicle, say, hey, I'm taking it in my possession. And, and so once I got that vehicle out of there, my investigator, he read the black box data that Buckeye did not read. He also, uh, like I said, we're still waiting on the information from the uh, infotainment system. But in the meantime, we learned uh, from the black box data um, that the um, the vehicle speed, of course, uh, but the also uh, that the uh, with the initial crash uh, of the vehicle, the airbags deployed, there was um, 11 additional miles uh, driven on a vehicle after the airbags deployed, which I didn't know vehicles can do that. Uh, the other thing was um, there was 46 initial cycles after the air bass deployed. Somebody was trying to crank the car 46 times or have cranked the car 46 times. And, and, and you know, uh, those two the initial things that came out. Also, looking at the vehicle, there's hmm. two impressions. If you put the picture back up again, there's sure. two impressions on the windshield. Um, when my investigator looked at those, the impression, the imprint or, or the point of, point of contact, uh, it was appeared that somebody took a bat or some large object and bang, b uh, beat the windshield on both sides like they're trying to get at something. Uh, and then the other part, you guys, uh, the, everybody know about the red transfer paint when you examine the vehicle. Uh, there's red transfer paint on the passenger side of the part. You can see the little boots in there right around in the area on that side of the vehicle. Uh, there's a red transfer paint that my, the vehicle, my son's vehicle, came in contact with something red. Um, mm -hmm. And um, also, uh, like I said, the, all the airbags in the vehicles deployed. There's no roof damage outside of the, if you guys can look at the panel, um, um, the Buckeye Police Department said he kicked his way out of that roof. Uh, but there was no roof damage from rollover. You know, so if you guys ever seen a rollover vehicle, you know, the roof would have been caved in a little. Uh, there would have been scratches and, and things on the, um, 
I, I don't know to call those handles where you put your jet skis and stuff like that on. Mm -hmm. uh, but he he noticed that the vehicle didn't fully roll over. So, so in other words, the 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 damage on the vehicle from his his assessment and looking at the damage in detail did not match that terrain. Um, so so to make a long story, he stopped putting those things together, and he oh. could figure out that it may be a stage event. But he found that out that it definitely was a stage event once the infotainment system um, information came out to put those things together. Uh, we got the time that the first incident happened around one o'clock. It was like twelve twelve fifty eight um that that um that that evening that afternoon so so we do know those information those are the things that came out about their that the the, uh, the vehicle itself so you're telling me that outside of everything if he crawled out of that out of that window uh the the sunroof then the it was not kicked out or anything of that sort it was opened manually from inside from like whatever he used like you know uh, uh he pressed a button and it opened um, and he, and that's maybe how he got out. He didn't mm -hmm. kick his way out, or did he kick his way I, out? I, I wouldn't. I can't. <clears throat> I can't say about him kicking out, but I can say the panel. If you look at that, it's two panels up there. One is still there. The other one is missing. It's yeah. right there, tucked up under the. If you look at that picture, it's tucked up under where the shoe is. The boot is on that side of the vehicle. That's it. The boot is lying on top on top of that uh, panel. That panel. The vehicle's lying on that that sunroof panel. So if the vehicle's on its side uh, right there, let's say after that accident, it rested like that, and they say from that point, Daniel kicked his way out of the sunroof. How is the panel stuck up under the front end of the vehicle? Let's he lift the vehicle up, slid it up under there, and then let the vehicle uh, go. So the bottom, said, I see what you're right, saying. Just that so don't make sense. Knows. And also yeah. the boot is stuck up under there as well. That boot I, is kind of uh, tucked up on the front end of the vehicle. So those two I things. See. The other part is I want to mention really quick. The Buckeye Police Department assessment of the scene. They said there's some glass on the ground. If you look right there to your left, yes, uh, that's a glass. They say, oh, that's a sunroof glass. It's not the sunroof glass because that vehicle don't have a sunroof. Like typical vehicles have glass or sunroof. That do does not. They only have panels. Those panels cannot come out that vehicle without a key. Key is a key that's um, back there with a spare with a spare tire area would be in uh, most vehicle in the back of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. It's the key that you actually have to use to remove those panels. And so those are things that don't make sense to me, um, that he uses superhuman strength, according to Buckeye, kicked his way out of the sunroof, picked the vehicle up and tuck, tuck it up under the vehicle, and then threw some glass on the ground. Because I'm telling you, that glass, before it looked the way it looked, is very much shaped like a, uh, it's, it's, it's like a perfect shape. Like somebody took a glass and put it down the inside. Uh, crushing it with a hammer or something. That's what it appeared to me mm. and when I first saw that that glass on the scene. Now, the glass, if it's the vehicle glass, it would have to come from the only glass that's broken in that vehicle, broken out, like totally broken out, is the driver's door. If you can see right there. That's the only glass missing in that the, the entire vehicle. Uh, even the glass on the ground, uh, ground side, that's still intact. Not broken, not anything. It's still intact. So when they pull a vehicle up, all that stuff is still intact. The only one that's actually broken out is the um, the driver's door. And my investigator, from his assessment, that glass was broken out with the door open. And the reason why he know that is because um, the way the vehicle was hitting it with uh, the mirror is there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it was hit from the outside. The glass broke and it fell out outward because that's little to no glass in that vehicle itself. Got it. I, and I, I'm just showing this really quick so that you guys understand. This is the sun. You see the my my mouse here, just so we can get a, a better understanding. This is the the basically the panel to That's this right. sunroof right. that That's that right. that but got that got popped off somehow. But it's underneath. If you can see right here, right, it is underneath the car, as he just said. And then there's a boot. So that's his boot, allegedly. Allegedly right. that he left behind. Okay, but then if, if we go over here. And look at the the glass down here, right? right. There is, it, 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 like you just said, it just seems like it was just properly placed there, and someone took a hammer or, or maybe a rock because there's plenty of rocks around, and just smashed it up really quick to make it look like a crime scene. And then, of course, this right here, guys, so that you guys know, I'm assuming that's like a, a sun reflector that you put on a on a windshield. Right. Okay, right. guys. But this is the this is the this is the car, and this is how it was left. And uh, I'm assuming this is where the red paint was right here. No, it's on the other side of the vehicle where the panel on the ground where the boot is um, on the side. It's on that side of the vehicle. 
uh, lying under the vehicle. It's the red transfer. Oh, paint. it's oh, the red transfer paint is underneath right. the, the On car. That side of the vehicle, and that's nothing red gotcha. in the desert uh, that the vehicle could have come com- contact with. Yeah, uh, but it's weird because uh, Ken said, so about red transfer, said right, something red about paint. using red paint to spray right. paint some uh, some rocks in the area that he drove off on the the path or the trail that he that your son drove off on which still doesn't this this is so uh bizarre okay guys um extremely extremely bizarre um so that piece and the fact that the car drove another 11 miles after the after the airbags were deployed says a lot the fact that the car was turned over four to six times after the the this impact, yeah, it's cranked um, up four to six times, right? Uh-huh. What, the, which is very very interesting right. as well. That says a lot. The other part that I found to be very very interesting as well is that you're saying that your private investigator has proof that that car was placed there. Can you expand on that a little bit? Your private investigator is saying that. Uh, let me show you guys this again. That this car, once more, this car right here was placed there not just rolled down a hill or anything that this car was actually staged and placed there i know you said that earlier but i wanted to really emphasize on that because this is what your private investigator and let me say this too not buckeye police department but your own private investigator is saying right now can you expand on that please my brother well, that's that's based on, like I said, that's information from the damage itself, the assessment of damage, the red transfer paint, um, the way the vehicle uh, came down that that ravine. Um, it was it actually rolled down that ravine, and, and the, the way he was able to get that is because there's a the, the vehicle said it was. I think the vehicle was going almost near thirty miles per hour uh, before. Uh, at, that's the speed of the vehicle before it hit the bottom of that that ravine. Hmm. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, he he did the distance. Um, it would take, uh, you know, from that expert thing he does, uh, the distance, it wasn't enough distance to even gain that speed with an SUV in the desert, right? Because you guys imagine, I'm, the way you give you an example, uh, most people have, probably have not been in a desert situation, but if you're in a desert situation, the, the terrain is not smooth like you're riding down your your road in the city or somewhere, you're riding some asphalt and your vehicle, you can take off and your vehicle can get from whatever you got to three, uh, uh, zero to 60 in three seconds or something. You cannot do that in the desert. Uh, tell care what kind of vehicle you're driving, and and the reason why because the terrain is not a, a flat terrain. It's a bouncy, bouncy up and down. You got you got brush. You got all kind of things going on. Cactus, you know, you name it. Uh, yeah. So you're not able. to, It's a lot of drag. First of all, uh, and the area to get to that ravine it goes uphill, and it's only one one flat surface, and the flat surface the distance is not long enough to like if you know if you think about a runway, you got to get that speed up. Uh, to get to 30 miles per hour. We tried it. We tried it also. He did it by measurement. It was impossible. He also did it by utilizing desert vehicles. We had desert vehicles that's made for that terrain, um, ride on that terrain like it ain't nothing. We used quads and razors um, to get up the speed, and they couldn't even do it. Those are lightweight vehicles. Could not get that speed up in that, that manner of time. Interesting. So so we put all those things together, uh, coupled with um, the damage on the vehicle, not matching terrain, the red transfer paint that came in contact with something red, um, Nothing red in the desert, um, and, and so so uh, those things coupled together would say that, um, uh, and also the rancher story, his account that it wasn't there too. He was there, it wasn't there. So, uh, so you're telling me, and, and, and get it, get it, get a sip of that, get a sip of that water, yeah, brother. Take there, your time. Thank you, thank yeah, you. I know you've been saying a lot. Okay, um, so t- you know, take your time, take your time. We're, this is this is all very important information. <laughs> yeah. So you tell. I'm sorry about that. I've been losing my voice for the last couple. You of days. good? You did? Did you try the hot toddy? I did. Like, it I to- actually worked. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking I a little told better. You. Yeah, I told yeah. you. Okay, yeah. use it again after, when you before you go to bed at night. Okay, I, I promise you, it would make you feel 110 percent better tomorrow. Um, so when it comes to the ranch, the, the rancher, right? You said that the rancher said it wasn't there, right? The car wasn't there. And then all of a sudden, poof, it was there. Uh, right. did, what was the time period that the rancher said, okay, I looked in this area and it wasn't there. And I came back a day later, two days later, an hour later. What was the time span? Yeah. He just said on the 17th, um, the vehicle was found on 19th, of course. 
on 17th, he was out there. Um, he's a, he's a, he, he explained himself as a fourth generation cattle rancher. He have free woman cattle. We just see them out there a lot. Right. Uh, but with those cattle do, they come in, I guess they automatically know it's a, it's a corral that's south of the ravine where the vehicle is found. Um, it's a corral south of that. That ravine goes downhill. And, um, uh, it, it's a it's a corral there. He said his cattle uh, comes to through that that ravine to get to that 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 um that um corral. And so on the seventeenth, he was there to uh, see if those cattle came through that area. He was tracking them, and when he he got to that ravine, <clears throat> excuse me, got to that ravine, he noticed that the vehicle that those um cattle did not come through there yet. So two days after that, he says out there again uh, to track those um, cattle. And he got to that ravine to see if they made it through. And, mm. um, of course, he saw the vehicle. And he said the way he saw it when he got there on the scene, he said uh, the way the vehicle looked, because, you know, he's a desert guy. He said, I'm out here all the time. I see things, vehicles left out or whatever the case may be all the time. Right. And he said what, what stood out to him when he first looked at it was that the vehicle was very clean, meaning, meaning that he thought it was um, – he didn't mention no clothing on the ground. He didn't mention anything, but he did mention how clean the vehicle was. As in, if it was, um, 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 you know, if the vehicle was there for a length of time, you know, of course it had desert dirt on it. Right. Uh, but he, he definitely said yes. He, when he saw it, he thought it was some, it's something that just happened. Him and his worker was out yelling for the person, trying to get, see if they needed any help. Yeah. Uh, they didn't find anybody, but he said he looked at the vehicle. He said he thought he heard something about that on local news. Uh, he took a picture of the license plate. He called um, uh, Buckeye Police Department. And he gave him a license plate number. And they said, yeah, that's a vehicle they was looking for. Gotcha. He said it took about two hours before they showed up. Uh, he was a little uptight about that because, you know, um, they took their time. But once they got there on the scene, he said as soon as they got on the scene, the first thing they told him, said, um, whatever you do, don't, don't, don't alert the media and don't alert the family that this vehicle's found. And Why? despite, you know, I don't know. And they guys, the buck I know, I've been out there every week with volunteers, hundreds, uh, trying to rescue my son. Um Why? Oh yeah, they told him not to alert us for whatever reason. Don't and, let us know, right? And, and also, I want to add into this piece is that from our conversation before, you told me it took them three hours to contact you to let you know about this car being found. Well, actually, it was over twenty four hour over twenty four hours before they alerted me. Uh, they 24 waited four hours. Yes, over twenty four hours. The vehicle was found on nineteen. They called me on the twentieth that morning. Um, over 24 hours later, after the vehicle was found by this rancher, they called me and I was uptight about it. I said, well, why didn't you tell me yesterday? He said, oh, because we didn't want to disturb your sleep. What? I'm like, oh yeah, it was crazy. That, that made me angry. So you think I'm sleeping. I'm out here in Arizona for South Carolina. I'm out there in the desert with hundreds of people, volunteers, uh, searching up day and night, trying to get my son's story out on the media. And you think I'm, and they know this, Buck, I knew this. And you think I'm sleeping? Oh, yeah, that, that's crazy. Uh, yeah, in a time yeah. like this, there's no time to sleep, right? Right. Um, sure. You're up 24-7. Your phone is right next to you, right, you're right next to you. If you even, exactly. even, if, even if you do doze, doze off, it ain't on vibrate. It it's ain't on silent. On vibrate. That's right. That's so right. What, what, what the hell, 24 hours before they actually contact you and your family to let you know that the car was found? found. And right. then they told the rancher not to tell, not to notify it's you, dope. family, nothing is what, what the hell is this all about? Uh, oh my know. lord that's yes. uh, okay that that's that's insane as well uh and we, uh, again like i said we gonna we're gonna talk about buckeye don't worry buckeye pd we're gonna talk about that here in a second now i do know that there was something else about this app i i, I guess there was a new app that you were able to use um to to uh, to find can you explain a little bit about this 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 app that you were able yeah. to use for yeah. for Daniel and his cell phone and all that, as far as the ravine, the finding it in the ravine and all that. Yeah, when that phone was returned to me from the Buckeye Police Department, there was a couple of things that was missing. I was desperately trying to get search history. When I say search history, that's why I'm saying where Buckeye got this from. But I was looking to search here. That was deleted. Um, Google didn't want to give that to me, but I tried to get some of information. I tried to get the location because there's also Google Maps and that give you location. So that way I can find ways to... Uh, locate where my son was located. So um, on the day he went missing, uh, but those things were deleted out the phone. When I said deleted, somebody went in and actually deleted the, the memory card was missing. So every avenue that I had, everything about the young lady, everything was intact except uh, message wise, except for the information with the young lady that was erased out the phone as well. 
Uh, and and so when I when I um, um, started examining Daniel's phone, phone I, I did have a sent out to try to get some forensics done in the past. But I didn't get anything much from that. But I noticed this thing, this app on there called Mile IQ. Uh, I didn't know what it was. I was going through everything, Instacart, all kind of apps. But it's Mile IQ. I looked it up, and it was a locational type app that Daniel had on his phone. Um, of course, it was no information to get. So I found a way to find, get in contact with a guy named Charlie. He's one of the owners of that app, of the company. And I was able to get in contact with him to try to get information and say, hey, look, you got any, like, location uh on the 23rd um you know from his phone and stuff so he tried to do the best he can he told me to send it i had to go through some kind of uh chat or something the way to send him the official right request. but i was able to get um uh, information from the owner he said that well uh, unfortunately there was nothing there from the and that was weird to me he, he thought it was weird for him as well the app stopped working stopped recording anything uh from the 22nd uh after the 22nd the 23rd he has nothing I mean, it was really problematic, <coughs> problematic for me because that's what I really needed. Mm -hmm. He did have some things from the 22nd on before that. So I thought it was important that maybe some days leading up to what happened to make have some questions as well. So he was able to, but he said he didn't have any waypoints and things like that. He can actually, uh, you know, get like stop and stop type deals because that's the only time Daniel used the app was before he went missing. And so he was able to get that on a spreadsheet and send it to me. But then um, he said Buckeye want. I told Buckeye about it, the Malakue app afterwards, and they wanted the information, so they tried to contact the Charlie guy as well, uh, but he wasn't willing to release that to them. So I had to, you know, make a long story short, give him permission to give that to Buckeye, and so that's where we at with this Malakue app. <laughs> Buckeye is now saying saying that they was able to get something that the owner told me he couldn't get, but they're saying they have um, uh, information from the Malakue app that, that's put in Daniel's phone in this ravine at 10 o'clock, I think it was like 10 or eight or something like that, that mm -hmm. morning he went missing. And you know, um, it, what cut from, for me, it, it sounded like good news to many people say, hey, yeah, you got some information, <coughs> excuse me, that would say that um, uh, Daniel's uh, uh, vehicle was there for 30 days, I guess. I, from my point of view, you guys, and that's the reason why I'm, I really have to stress this up front, I have questions about anything that Buckeye do, and I have my reasons why. But one thing for sure, that it don't match all the other information that we have about Dane's vehicle. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's okay, my brother. Take your time. Take your time. Get get some, get a drink. Get. Oh, you're okay. Oh, excuse me, guys. I'm, I'm losing it real bad. It's okay. Match anything. I apologize. It's okay. It's okay, my brother. You good. You good. Okay. Um. Uh. You know. And 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 take your time, man. Take your time. Take your time. Okay. <coughs> no, you're good. You're good. Yeah. You're good. I've been having you're issues good. with my throat for the last couple of days. So yeah. yeah. No, I know you've been you've been on a lot of shows and, yeah. and and talking a lot. So I understand that. And 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 one thing that you have right now is, that is more important than anything is your your voice. So that's just right. take care of it because right. you know you are speaking on behalf of your son and your your family. So <coughs> just 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 start using those hot toddies like I've been mm -hmm. telling you. Okay, trust me. Sounds you'll thank good. me later. You'll thank me later. Okay, that's right. That's um, right. But it is that is very interesting information. I mean, obviously, the when it comes to the the app and finding out more information and the fact that certain things stop recording after the twenty second, that seems a bit odd as well. The fact that we find out that you through your private um, eye through your private investigator that <laughs> the, that he has proof that the car was actually placed there, right. saying that the car has been sitting there for thirty days when really it seems like it had only been there for what a day or two, um, given the fact that the Rancher sitting there going, the car is in is clean, meaning like there's no dust or sand or anything of dirt that settled onto the car or anything of that set sort over the over the time of 30 days. I mean, that's 30 days for the car to be sitting down there in that ravine. Now, there's something else that I found interesting as well uh, that you 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 mentioned uh, to me. Uh, something about getting down to the ravine. Um, that the car would have taken a significant amount of time to get to the actual place in which it was found. 
Right. Right. Well, well one thing is uh, with the MyLiQ app, that's why I say I question that because um, from the information I got from the owner as well, um, that book I put out there, um, we have information from the vehicle itself, uh, from the infotainment system that put that first incident at one o'clock near, like I told you guys, 12, 58, somewhere around there, or uh, 58, 59, um, that the first incident happened. That's that's data. But then they say they have the MyLiQ app that put down your phone in that ravine at 10.08. I think it was something like that. And those two things can't, everything can't be true at the same time. That's what I'm saying. The, the rancher is saying the vehicle wasn't there for what, uh, two days prior. You put all these things together. The app that they're saying they have on the report now that's putting down your thing at 10 o'clock in the morning. And also the information is putting that the vehicle went there for 30 days. And it's plus it was the first accident happened at one. That means if that vehicle, the app is right, uh, that means the vehicle took three hours to get from the top of that ravine. It's on a 20-foot ravine. Three hours from the top of that ravine down to the bottom, the rest down there where we found it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's impossible. So I'm saying all those things simultaneously can't be true. So that's the reason why even with the Buckeye Police Department, you guys, I see the, the narrative they're putting out there. I see they say, hey, we got this app. This is the data. We we, we, was, we was right all along. They were saying the vehicle was there for 30 days before um, um, doing any anything uh, to, yeah. to have some reason they weren't there for 30 days. And and so I had to look at uh, everything we have and put that together, what they said they found, and then come to the truth of the whole story. Right. And, 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 and by the way, guys, let me just re-emphasize -em this too. Forensics still was not performed on the car or any of the findings around the car, the clothes, the shoes, the cell phone that was found near the car as well. Literally, it was clothes, cell phone, all of these things. And the car, let's not forget the car too. None of them were run forensically, if that even is even a well, word. Well, the only thing done, like I said, when I requested them to do the fingerprinting, Mm. That's what the only thing I do know any type of forensic, forensic, <clears throat> forensic was done on the vehicle was the fingerprinting. They said they did, um, uh, which I don't see any results from that. The swab, the swabbing of the steel wheel, the shifter, I don't see any results of that. But that's still the airbags, you know, because anybody knows when airbags hit you, it pulls off DNA. Oh, of course. Um, and also the driver side, passenger side, the same way. Um um, the clothing on the ground. It was no, nothing else. Red transfer pay, we still have questions about. So Forensically, things have not been done. And the things they say they've done with the swabbing, uh, this is the catcher, you guys. Uh, the Buckeyes say they, the Postal Department said they did this that when I asked them that. That was in July of, of uh, 2021 when I asked them to do the swabbing of that vehicle. So they took these swabs. Here it is in 2023. Uh, I get a call from Buckeye Police Department asking me for a razor. Uh, do, do you have one of Daniel's razors so we can uh, check this, this the swabbing that we did and see if it matches anything said as Daniel? Right. That don't make sense to me. Almost three, almost two years later, uh, you just now deciding to ask me for a razor after Daniel's apartment's been dismantled. His apartment's not there anymore. Right. You're supposed to do that in 2021 after you did the swabbing. What you did the swabbing for? You, if you really right. did the swabbing. Why after the fact? Why way after the right. fact? Right. See, that, that's what's frustrating to me uh, it when it comes to the, that that due diligence that they should have been doing within the first 24 hours of that person missing or that crime scene or whatever. All that stuff should have been happening, should have been done way before that, not two years later. Oh, by the way, do you have his toothbrush? It's like, I didn't hold on to that. I we threw that away or, or I misplaced it is somewhere, but it could be contaminated with other things now. Right. You, yeah. you think it still has DNA on it now, two years later. I, I hate it. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's frustrating. Or when they go, Oh, a month later, we're going to look at security cam footage at that gas station. And of course the gas station goes, well, we wipe out after 30 our, days. Right? Mm -hmm. after 30 days. So it's yeah. like, Oh darn, we can't get all the information that we need. That is right. very, very frustrating. And this is why I'm really happy to talk to you about this next piece. And our last part of this conversation, Buckeye PD, let's talk about it. Now I understand that you are trying to get this case transferred to some another police department because right. you feel that Buckeye you feel that the performance by 
BPD has been extremely lackluster. Can we talk about that for a second? Yeah, yeah. As you guys know, uh, the initial point, it started at the beginning. You know, of course, if you're a family member trying to find your loved one, you're not thinking, you, you're looking for law enforcement's help. That's what you do. We call the law enforcement. Uh, once they told me they weren't going to look for Daniel, um, uh, you know, asked for, once I found out he actually went missing in the desert, first I didn't know exactly what it did, did, you know, what, where Daniel was lo uh, located last. They say off near the White Taint Mountains. So, um, um, once I found he was missing out in the desert, I asked them to go do a helicopter search, go out there in the desert to find him. They told me they couldn't do it that night. <coughs> They'll try to do it, do it in the morning. Of course, uh, the morning came. They say, uh, the guy said, hey, we're going to have a helicopter go out. The morning came. Um, it was unauthorized, he told me, by his higher-ups. Uh, higher uh, they said, Dave's a grown man. They had an assumption now. They didn't tell him this, but they said, uh, Dave's a grown man. If he want to disappear on his own, he can. That's exactly how the Buckeye Police Department put it to me. And and so hmm. by me knowing how my deal is with law enforcement, I'm a black man, and, and I'll be honest with you, that took a lot of thought in my head. I heard those languages before with law enforcement and past history of everything that's going on with my friends. They were, had no intentions to go look for Daniel. So um, along with other things that was discussed with the Buckeye Police Department, that caused me to leave and go out and go do what I did, driving my car over 2,000 miles to come out in Arizona to go search for my son. Um, the thing is, I'm saying from the, from the beginning, the drop of the ball, the uh, uh, not getting cell phone pings. To this day, we still don't have cell phone pings. I mean, they talking about the Malik app. Yeah. Where's the cell phone pings? Uh, the 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 ironicy with you connect. My son had you connect in the vehicle. It's almost like an OnStar. Um, that tells you locations of where a vehicle is located. We asked about that. They would look into that. They first this is what they first told me. They tried, the Buckeye Post about changed their story. They told me at first met my daughter. They said, "Look, uh, we look. We well, <clears throat> we looked into the first of all. They told me they couldn't get information from the Uconnect, but they said they contacted Uconnect, and Uconnect told them when they tried to connect to it or whatever. They said um, device being out of tamper with or the batteries being disconnected because it cannot, um, um, you know, they could not get anything from that Uconnect because it also has some kind of beacon to it." Mm -hmm. And that only happens when somebody actually does something to it to manipulate it. So that's what it told me up front. But then they changed and said, oh, we was able to get into it, but it came out with all zero grids. Meaning that we was able to get information from this Uconnect, but it was zero grids. So we cannot find no location. I said, okay, well, I've been, um, I said, well, show me some camera footage um, of my son going to work that day. They said they couldn't find none. Well, I got facetious. I said, well, give me any footage he ever been in Arizona. <coughs> and they still they still say um, that they uh, um, don't have any footages. So I'm saying, so those initial things that happened that caused me to know that the Buckeye Police Department is doing everything, in my opinion, uh, to keep me from answers than to, to give me answers. When the vehicle right. finally showed up, you guys, it's been a, it's been a fight. Um, I, I, I interviewed the rancher. He gave me a full story. We got recorded. He said he'd go to court, testify uh, to what he's seen at that scene two days prior. The vehicle wasn't there. And I tried to get that to the Buckeye Police Department. To this date, you guys, you would not see that in, in, the, in the police report because it goes against their theory. They started off when they told me about he had brain injury and things like that, that that vehicle was there for 30 days. And then what they was basing on at that time, is they said um, a hard hat was filled with rainwater, and um, and it's filled, and it didn't make sense to me. And that's the reason why I said you guys, I started asking for an investigator because mm -hmm. they based their thirty days on rainwater inside a hard hat, and the hard hat was inside the vehicle. Only, 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 only glasses broken out that vehicle is on the pass on the on the driver's side. Like I told you, if the measure rain coming down there, and it wasn't raining that much in Arizona, it don't rain like that. They had the monsoons starting the monsoon season, so it was getting some rain. But this 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 hard head was inside the vehicle and it filled up with rainwater, they say. And it had this business card in there. If it was there for 30 days, it would start, you know, paper start kind of tearing up in water. It was very much intact. I was looking at this picture they showed me. And then I look at the, the vehicle on the inside, the interior they showed me through the pictures that they gave me. And if the hard hat filled up the water, why there's no puddles of water in the vehicle itself? 
You know, like mm -hmm. if it's lying on the ground, that's a glass, and that's almost like a bowl itself, that glass sitting on the ground, the, the, the door. There's no puddle of water there, but somehow that hard hat got a full hat of water. I said, no, somebody put water in there. Yeah. To, to make it appear to be 30. So it, it's those kind of things um, that stood out to me. That And of course, I can understand why that would make you want to transfer this case over to a different department um, that might actually give more care, well, right? You know, also, Handle the situation better. Go well, ahead. Well, yeah. Also, I meant to say, and I hate to cut that off, I apologize. You um, it. It's also because um, they haven't brought us any, anything closer to answers. Everything you guys know about my son's case came from my efforts. I know they're taking credit for you guys reading the report. Those are my efforts. And, and I'm not saying in a way to say, hey, y'all look at me. I did all this work, but I have. All the investigation, the red transfer paint, the 11 additional miles, the everything you guys know about this vehicle, it came from my efforts. It did not, those information was not given to you guys by the Buckeye Police Department. They put in a report certain little key things they want to put in there um, that's, that would talk against their 30-day theory. But, um, but those are the things that I have been working hard for and getting those answers from my, my investigative standpoint. And rather it came from my investigator that I paid for or came from my own efforts. Those things right. there. So they haven't brought us anything closer, even up to this Mile IQ app that they came up with. If you guys go through, go that direction with this Mile IQ app, what, what it does, it raises more questions, right? It, it raises more questions. At the end of the day, they could talk about, they put in a report to talk about how, what Ms. McGrath thinks about me or this person say, or he has search history of this, but they don't have anything that say what happened to Daniel. It, they centralize the, the case it gets y'all talking about, oh, he's maybe in love with some woman or, right. or this. Look over here. Um, but what happens to my son? Yeah. Sensationalizing the case instead of actually finding out what happened to my son. So I think that a fresh set of eyes, I've been asking for the FBI involvement. You guys know I did over 30, uh, eight, uh, 38, 39, uh, well, I'm sorry, uh, 45, 45 weeks of search. I'm getting 49 weeks of searches. 35,000 acres of land was covered out there. We found human remains. Um, you guys know that. Uh, bring closures for other families. And, and, and not one time, uh, excuse me, not one time has Buckeye uh, uh, found anything. That, like I said, they haven't, they've been, they say they did these searches. If you did these searches near the well where the vehicles found, we found a human skull like a few hundred feet away from uh, where the vehicles found. They said they used cadaver dogs, police dogs, right. and they found nothing. But we are volunteers that found this. So to make a long story short, I That's feel wild. that <laughs> I feel that. <clears throat> excuse me, if I get another uh, department to actually look into Dan's case, I've been asking for FBI. That been rejected by the Buckeye Police Department. Whatever they told the FBI, they said the FBI said you, Mr. Robert, doing such a great job on your own. We don't have to come in. Um, I'm trying to make sure that another department. The Buckeye can't keep blocking these other departments. Another department come in and uh, can, can get a fresh eye on my son's case and uh, maybe get the answers I'm looking for. But I'm going to throw in this real quick. I know I'm putting a lot, uh, Mr. Pascal. I apologize. You're good. You're good. Uh, but one of the other things as well is I want everybody to understand with this report, they mentioned the the um, Tempe Police Department and they mentioned this forensics work that was done on all my son's electronics. It took me months of um, having meetings with uh, the mayor of Tempe, uh, Mayor Woods, along with the chief of police at the time, uh, Chief Glover. He's also, now he's with the DPS uh, Department of Public Safety and the assistant chief, Chief Anderson and my team. We sat there on meetings at the meetings and I finally convinced the Tempe Police Department to do all the forensics on Dane's electronics. It had nothing to do with Buckeye. And the reason why we did it that way is because I don't trust Buckeye. I gave them everything. We have made arrangements where I can bring everything out of the day from Dave's apartment, electronic-wise, and give it over to the Tippy Police Department for them to do forensics work. So they did right. forensic work on electronics. And this is another thing you guys don't hear in the report. And you got to ask yourself the questions why. You know what I'm saying? I'm giving you all the stuff y'all not going to have in the report. By the way, uh, they look at the electronics. And, um, but my, my agreement with them, and I'll be honest with you, I, I thought it was a bad agreement because I thought they didn't do what they did, but I, my team reminded me they, what they said. But I didn't want them to give any information to the Buckeye Police Department. I did, and I can be honest, and I did say that. 
um, because I don't trust them. But Tempe Police Department is a police department. They say, hey, look, Buckeye, I have a case open. So whatever we found on your son's electronics, we have to share it with the Buckeye Police Department. Okay, great. So yeah. they was able to do that. But I was saying those those uh, those efforts, the forensics that was done on electronics actually uh, um, tied in some other key elements in my own personal investigation with me and my investigator um, that would say somebody was in Daniel's apartment after the vehicle show up, you get showed up, you guys tapping around his apartment and looking through his search history on his uh, on his uh, on his uh, uh, personal computer. Mm -hmm. But you don't see that in the report. That's what the problem I'm saying, guys. So that suggests to us that another element of the foul play after 30 days, my son vehicle showed up in that that ravine, ravine out there. A few days after that, somebody was in his apartment, no forced entry, searching and tearing his apartment apart. Because we didn't know exactly when this happened. But you know, tell this wait, wait. move apart, looking for something. They're looking for something, and we just don't wait, know what it is. Wait, wait. <laughs> yeah. Time out. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. You, you just slipped right, that one right under the radar. Hold on. Yeah. Can, can you, So somebody broke into – somebody – didn't break into his house, his house, but somebody got into his house, ripped his place apart. Well, not the whole entire place, the, the bedroom. I, they, I ripped, you guys, right. uh -huh. they ripped the bedroom apart. Do we know at all what they were looking for or what this person was I, looking for? I don't, I don't. My investigator, when he first showed me the, uh, the, the, the pictures of my son's um, apartment, because I didn't go in. I let him go in as an investigator. Wow. Uh, and he took pictures of his bedroom, and it's it a mess. It was really bad. You need and to send me. Can you send me those photos? Yes, I, can. I, I need can. them like ASAP, Rocky. Okay. Yeah. Um. But that, that's insane. So, but okay. So, do we know when this this walk in? Because it wasn't really a break in. It, it, somebody opened the door when this uh this thrashing of his bedroom went down. Do we know what date and time that went down? Any security oh, cameras did. picking it up or anything of that sort? We didn't at the time, but I was saying that for instance, the for instance tied it in for us because at the time when um, my wow. investigator came and he, he did assessment the apartment, like I said, I thought it was that day was being messy with his room. I said, oh, I felt embarrassed. Oh, it's a prayer. Oh, man, God. Well, at least he got his room messy and not the whole entire apartment. Uh, but my investigator, it's more pictures that I haven't show, showed to the public. And that's the reason why I probably still can't right now. But there's some pictures of his closet, uh, uh, also inside his closet and things like that. Where things was pulled open, pulled out of there. Somebody was looking for something, right? And, and right. We didn't never at the time before the forensic done on electronics. We did not know. We said, "Hey, it could have been Daniel before he went missing. He could have been doing something. We don't know. Right. Looking for something and left to go to work." Uh, but what tied it in for us is when the forensics came. The forensics showed that somebody was on his computer after July the twenty um, um, at July the nineteenth. That vehicle showed up. Uh, somebody a few days after that. Somebody was in his apartment looking for something. They were doing search histories on his uh, computer, his personal computer. So they'll tap around with his personal computer, uh, look for things. And that ties in. They say, okay, well, somebody was here. Nobody had access to Daniel Park. We didn't even have access to his apartment. So somebody was in there in that meantime looking for something. Uh, well, okay. But, 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 but okay, so so now that you know that he was – somebody went into his place, wrecked the, the bedroom. Okay, two different questions, okay? One, did they do any work for, uh, forensically, uh, get dusting for prints, anything like that inside or outside of his bedroom? That's question number one. Well, I, I want to say this right here. And it's embarrassing for me. I did hire my private investigator who went in with the bag. And this is all I know. And I, I can't say he don't work for me anymore, by the way. Okay. Uh, but he, he went in with his bag that day when I gave him assets, gave him the keys to the apartment and left him there. When we finally got access to the oh. apartment, left him there. He took a bag. He said, Hey, I'm about to do forensic work. He has some, I guess, luminol. I think the name he told me the stuff is called. I don't know anything about that, but it's, I think it's got a study to check for blood. And he said he's going to go through there and see what he can find and let me know. Mm. Now, to high sight and to this day, I don't have any information from Mr. McGrath of any forensic work that he did there outside of him saying, Hey, this is what, show me pictures, say, This is what happened. Somebody was looking for something. Blah, blah blah and then like I say, high sight now with the forensics to tie those things in together. But as if forensics test for blood and stuff like that, I don't have anything. No. Damn. Okay. Then next question. 
now that you know that there was somebody went in there and they went to his computer and they were searching what were they searching for was there anything typed in there was it another tempe uh, arizona explosion type of google search uh, on the computer I can't, I can't tell you what those uh searches was but no it was nothing um even similar to that but I, about well, i won't be able to uh, right now discuss what what the searches were uh, cause that is like on, the, you, on the report, but yeah, we do have what those searches were. So yeah. you do know, okay. You you just don't, you just don't have them in your possession saying like, okay, this is what exactly what they were looking for. Right. I do have okay. those uh, in my possession, but I'm saying I won't, I won't be able to release that to the public right now. Okay. Okay. Can, can, can I ask you this then? I, I'm going to push a little bit because that's, that's a big, that's a big <laughs> deal. That's very, that's very big deals. Okay, guys. Um, <laughs> remember, remember what you said earlier about him knowing some things about this smart city type of thing does any of the searches have anything to do with that not that i can recall no i, I can't remember anything with that okay um is it anything that has to do with anything controversial that could maybe catch himself in some trouble uh not necessarily it depends on how you look at things but no no i didn't see anything uh that would be really controversial. Okay. Just the fact that somebody actually was on his computer is more, I think, the main thing that um, we were looking at from Tempe, from the poly law enforcement standpoint. Wow. Well, that's interesting news. I've never heard that before anywhere in, in the news that somebody actually right. it's not there. Okay. It's very selective, right? So no one, so so you're getting it here first, correct, guys? Uh, correct, yeah. David? That someone went into Daniel's home ransacked his bedroom went to, to through his computer searching for something he david knows what it is he's not at liberty to say anything right now and i understand because it could mess right. up with the right. investigation right but that is some big news and this happened after the fact this is after he, danny went missing the car was found if i'm correct yeah. That's this correct. is 30 days after Daniel's car was actually found. You hear it right here first, everybody. That is huge. And it does make me wonder, what the heck? Now, one other question uh, surrounding the apartment, because it's an apartment, right? It is. So is there any security cam footage? Have you guys looked into that? Just seeing anybody walking in and out of the place? Anything like that? Well, I can't tell you this. Uh, we did uh, talk to uh, the the owner of uh, the uh, landlords and things like that. Try to find okay. any type um, of, of, of video or cameras around. People have rings or whatever. Case it be, we had they had none. Uh, all outside of the uh, actual uh, office building, the office building itself had the the camera system, of course, inside. Um, but outside as well, the neighborhood itself, um, there are businesses across from the apartments. Uh, we check with them as well to see if there's any footage that we can find. Um, yeah. Couldn't get anything from that. Nothing. One, one thing I can tell you that I, I, I also relate to Buckeye Police Department, which they not didn't follow up on. I wish I would have followed up on. I didn't. Is that uh, one day my daughter and I and another young lady we were going to day day's apartment complex because she's gonna show me. We couldn't get access to this apartment to make a long story because we didn't have any way of we had no key or anything. Mm -hmm. And and so we went to the apartment complex, and we can tell you that it was a SUV looked just like that. My daughter was driving a different car because she knows exactly what Daniel's vehicle look, look, looks like. Right. I, she was trying to describe it to us. We were still having the discrepancy of what really the color is, uh, um, but um, she knows exactly what it looked like. We didn't, but she was in the car behind us. She got kind of stuck at the traffic light, so we got to the complex before she did. Just a few moments before she did. And and when we was coming into the cop, apartment complex, I do remember an SUV with about at least about four or five white guys, and they was laughing and having a good time. It looked just like what I would think would be Daniel's vehicle because of the red hooks in the front. But I wasn't sure because you know, the, the, the person I with me say, "Is that that look like the vehicle that they described?" You know, saying that look like Daniel. I said, "No, nah, no." Nah, I kind of dismiss it. No, nah, no. Nah. Got seen these guys and they like they was having fun, like they had nothing to do with it. I said, "Oh, that's ironic. That is the same type of vehicle." But that thing always sticks to my head to this date that someone was actually uh, riding uh, uh, outside of Daniel's uh, uh, apartment in, in that parking lot. So those things always in my mind about that. But uh, but definitely law enforcement not following up on um, this information that they do have now. And Buckeye have this information because Tippy was able to give them 
um, the results from the forensics. And that's coupled with the things that we tell Buckeye. They know everything that I know. Um, I haven't hold any evidence or anything from them. Um, okay. But, yes. No, no, no. And then, okay, so, so just so I understand this, you went over there, and this was after you guys found out that the car or that the apartment was broken into? This was after, or was this before? No, this was well, well before the vehicle oh, showed well up. Before. That, right. Uh, gotcha. Before the vehicle showed up uh, at that scene out there. Gotcha. Why uh, have you reached out to the FBI? Have you reached out to them to get them involved in in any of this? I have. I've reached out to the FBI uh, multiple times. Uh, the first time was when I started receiving death threats. Uh, I used to get death threats. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, people used to tell me things they had. They had Daniel's it was ransom things as well. Um, they had Daniel and stuff like that. So I started receiving death threats and uh, wow. with the FBI about it. They did a report. Uh, but they said they had to uh, get permission from, I guess, get accepted by Buckeye to, because since this Buckeye have a case on my son, mm-hmm. which I didn't know how that relates to me. Uh, but they said because of that, Buckeye had to invite them in pretty much. I went to Buckeye about it. You guys don't hear about that in the report as well. Um, they kind of, I won't say laughed at all because they didn't do anything about it. I started, had to, I had to carry you guys. I had to carry, my investigator told me um, once he came on the scene, like, David, this is Arizona, everybody, Got to assume everybody's carrying. So I used to have to carry every day because of the death threats. But I have not called the FBI to look into who was giving me death threat. These guys are calling from burner phones. There's e- somehow I got my email address and they threatened That's me through scary. email. And, you know, yeah, it was really bad. Um, so that was the first initial uh, take of trying to get the FBI involved. Uh, the second thing, um, which was denied, um, the second thing came from, uh, uh, like I said, I wrote a, a striking letter to Chief Hall. He just, uh, CNN was following me um, out in the desert, and they got a, 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 a interview with, with Chief Hall at the time. And I wrote in this letter uh, because we found human remains out there. My son went missing in the crime scene, uh, describing uh, the whole situation in my son's case. This is what is suspect. The vehicle is on federal land, uh, the BLM land, Bureau of Land Management. This mm. warrants the FBI to come look into Daniel's case. Um, you know, I need answers. I need the FBI to come in. Um, this is a big crime scene. We find in these, uh, we solve cases. I've solved the case for the Buckeye Poli- uh, for the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office, a missing car. They was looking for a stolen car. Uh, was able to recover that in my search for Daniel. So a lot of crimes happened right. My son went missing. So I kind of put that letter together. He agreed because he was put on the spot. Of course, he agreed. I asked for the FBI to come in then. Uh, as also my attorney, she has to be, be a part of that case review. Um, they did it behind my back. They probably doing it like this the second time. They did it behind my back. Uh, and they called, came back to me and said, hey, well, well, we did, had this meeting with the FBI. And they, and they said, the FBI said, Mr. Robinson, Mr. Robinson, you're doing such a great job on your own. We don't have to come in. That was a slap in my face. I don't really believe the FBI would say that. That's what they told me. And so now the oh, third time man. I'm hearing that the FBI is looking into this case, this I'm hearing now through their new report, because they got like five different reports. And this new report, they got the FBI is coming to this case. I wouldn't hold that as stock. I tell people in the public, that they did it before. I I, I want to see, no, no no FBI agent ever um, uh, came to me and say they, they're in a, you know, I think it's a courtesy. If they was inside my son's case, they would actually come in and let me know that. It's not something that is a secret. The FBI works in secret. And they're looking to a case without alerting the family. I, yeah. I don't believe that. No, I don't. I don't believe it either. Um, right. it, it, you know, it, David. Let me let me just say this. I, I'm just so sorry. I'm just so sorry, my brother, for all the stuff that you've been going through, the stories that have been out here that we've been able to confirm and to debunk here on the show. The the, the 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 treatment that they are, the way they are treating this case and are continuing to treat this case in this way is an abomination. And it breaks my heart because as much as we say ain't nothing like a mother's love, ain't nothing like a father's love to their kids. And you have done some amazing work and you have stopped at nothing to get your son back home, whether alive or gone. 
And I have to commend you for your heart and your hard work and not giving up. Right. Because it does take a lot of work to do what you're doing right now. And the the fact that you've been jumping through so many loopholes and you've been pushing through so many different barriers, knocking down so many brick walls. My, my Lord, you have been breaking through so many brick walls. This isn't paper thin. They're just, they're super solid, but you keep going through them like the Hulk. And I have to tell you, I got to commend you for all your hard work and your passion because without you doing this, they would just give you the runaround and your son and your son's name would be forgotten right now. So I commend you for all the passion. Real talk, man. Can I get one more, one more comment here? Um, and I say this to families all the time. Um, you know, one point that you just made, if I wouldn't have come out to Arizona, um, could you all guys imagine how this case would have gone? Um, <sighs> the vehicle showed up in 30 days. There would have been no vehicle. That vehicle would have been somewhere in the junkyard right now. All the evidence that's there, I'm still holding on. You guys, imagine this. I'm still holding on this vehicle to this vehicle with the airbags and all the stuff that need to be forensically tested. Still haven't been done. I'm holding the clothing items that need to be forensically tested. I'm holding all this other evidence that need to be forensically tested. So I'm saying is, if I hadn't came out to Arizona, there would have been no search for Daniel. There would have been no, and if I wouldn't have been been uh, going out the way I have gone, and I know some people say, hey man, you you seem like you're critical of law enforcement. I'm not. I'm pro police. I'm, I'm anti-corruption and slowness, especially in my son's case. Um, there would have been no action at all. If I was, a, the way I couldn't imagine myself, you guys, if I'm not one of those people, if I would have been in South Carolina and I'm calling Buckeye every day, say, hey, what y'all got? Did you find anything? Because I will be calling. And he say, I'm out here now. You he could be laying, as far as I know, you can be laying back against his desk, his foot up on the desk. Say, we out here now looking. I don't see it in my eyes. I don't see your actions. Uh, I, I cannot live that way. So I'm telling you guys, as from a from a father who's gone through this, the first thing you need to do is stay active into your person's case. Because I mean, when I say you, if you really, you have to fight hard. I know it's hard emotionally because it's hard for me emotionally. I, I have a, a advantage in some way. I'm a professional soldier. We've been trained to put a mission first. My son is a mission for me. I love my son. Of course, we're not leaving the fallen comrade. I'm definitely not leaving my son behind. So I utilize those strengths um, when it comes to military. But I do have emotions. That's my baby son. He's missing. And so, of course, it's painful. It's hard. It's hard, hard. But I'm saying, guys, you have to fight. You have to fight really hard for your, your loved one. I mean, when I say fight, because one thing is going to happen. If you don't fight and you push law enforcement, give them hell. I hate to say it that way, give them hell. If you don't fight law for, with law enforcement, keep them active. If you don't keep engaged with the, the public, start your website. Start a social media platform. Start talking about your loved one. Do what you have to do. I'm going to tell you because as soon as the case gets stale, it gets quiet, um, the law enforcement see that the family's not really pushing. They don't hear it in the public. The public ain't knocking on their doors. The way I look at it, what end up happening is your case, your loved one's case, will become a cold case. That's where cold cases come from. Yeah, how many times you guys know that cold cases are solved, right? 20 years later, they'll go back... The way that I look at it, and I say this many times, someone, my son, let's say Daniel, I haven't been active, and they say, well, Buck said, well, nothing, we did all we can do. And we this is cold case status. We have no more information. I see them putting Daniel's case file in a, a paper box, and they take it in this dark closet and put it in the back of this dark closet with all these other cases with cobwebs and spider webs on or whatever, dust, whatever. And it sits there on that shelf when I detect the biffing. Uh, after his whole entire career in law enforcement, he retired. A new, F, a new um, um, detective come into that police department, and and eventually go in that closet and say, "Hey, I want to solve one of these old cases." He opened it up, pulled Daniel's thing off the shelf, blow the dust off of it, go through it. A week later, he solved the case. They find Daniel. It wasn't the fact that it was a new officer right then. Twenty years later. It's just they they stopped right there. And nobody was continuing to push them. That that cold case wouldn't have became a cold case because evidence that's 20 years later was always there. You just got to make that person look. And that's why it's crucial for right now that Buckeye say they exhausted all their uh their leads, they said at one point. That's why it's crucial for me to get my son's case moved to a different department because I need a fresh set of eyes. That could be like that new 
uh, detective come in. Fresh set of eyes looking at it from a different angle and work my son's case, but it's done now. It's not ever going to become a cold case status because it's not a cold case status. There's so much things to, to explore in these cases. People don't just vanish. They don't just vanish out of, out of nowhere. There's always evidence there. You just got to make sure law enforcement acting upon each and last, last, last one of them. Me holding, holding my forensics work, holding that vehicle, holding DNA evidence that I don't know how long they're going to last, is there. I'm forcing law, law enforcement to take these forensics, do these forensics, prove to me that nobody else was in this vehicle, that type stuff. And, and, and I'm saying that's what you have to do as a family. It may sound like you're beating up on cops and this and that. Sometimes you have to do what you have to do as a, as a father, parent, mother, siblings, or whoever. Uh, for your loved one, because they don't have a voice. We got to be, we have to be a voice for them. Absolutely. Be- beautifully said. I'm just going to say that. And some people are also asking, uh, what can they do to help now? I mean, I, of course, you you just said some amazing stuff. Uh, some other, somebody else said, be that squeaky wheel. Absolutely. Uh, 110%. Right. But what can we do to help you in your case, finding your son? Yeah, currently, um, you know, you guys know I'm doing this mail-in protest. Um, and, you know, sometimes people want to say, well, how does, how, I have people say, hey, how does mail-in protest going to work? And I'll explain that to you. But the mail-in protest is, is designed to, to help everybody p- to participate in my efforts to get Daniel's case moved over to the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. And what you do is go to PleaseHelpFindDaniel.com. You can download these PDFs, um, the letters. And you send them in every week. I'm trying to send hundreds to thousands of them in this crowd there mailbox. I, it, that's where I look at it. Because what it does is letting them know I'm serious. I have the community behind me. I have the backing of the people. And I'm telling you, my, my, my uncle said this. As long as you got people backing you, you got power. I know they got the law. And those, we have power as the people sticking together. So uh, I need you guys, if you guys can, to get as many people you can to send out these letters every single Day is right up under that Unity uh, candlelight visual uh, information. You go stroll down. It's uh, right below you guys. You could go to policehelpfinddan.com and you'll see uh, the information there about the mail-in protest. Um, just pre- download these PDFs and send them in every week. That helps because I'm doing things in the background to get Daniel's case moved over. And if you do that, um, it helps. But I was saying to go back to the madness, madness part. Uh, so they say, hey, look, Mr. Robert, how is that helping? How is that going to help getting these, just sending these mails in? Right. Um, it's a method to the madness. I had a drill sergeant, and I said it many times. Um, her name is Drill Sergeant Hammond. And I was in basic training. And she, I used to get, I never did understand certain things. I, could, I used to get so frustrated uh, with this training because they have us doing, I thought, was stupid stuff. Like, I think what they were trying to do, irritate us or something. And it, she probably could see it in me. But she's always whispering in my ear. She says, <coughs> Rob, Robinson. There's a method to the madness. There's a method to the madness. She always whisper in my ear. Somehow she'll sneak in and say that to me. And I used to think about, because I used to have, we used to have this thing in the military where you actually have to grab, uh, when you're in the child hall, you have to grab uh, two drinks. You can't get one drink. I don't care if you just say, hey, I do thirst, I just want one drink. No, you have to get two drinks. So you have to hold it against your chest when you walk back to your table. You can get, get that after you get your food. But you had to get two drinks. You had to carry those two drinks and get your chest. I guess you kids can't see, but you got to hold it, get your chest really tight. And you go walk up to your table, and then you can put it down, right? It's a method to the madness. What it's really doing is teaching you how to hold grenades, right? Because if you pull a pin, you got to be able to hold it against your chest so it won't, the trigger won't get taken off. But anyway, that's, that's a method to a madness, certain things. I'm just using that as an example. Mm. But this madness, um, <clears throat> the method to what I'm doing is, the, the, every time they turn around, they see these picket signs coming in the mailbox. Uh, justice for Daniel. Uh, we, we, what we want, we want justice. We want it now. So you guys can see what, what those picket signs are. Those same ones that we can hold for the, for the physical protest. But for now, those are mail-in protests because I want them to continue to always keep Daniel on their mind. That's the law enforcement. And, and so in the background, you guys best believe I'm working elements and having these meetings with law, law enforcement to get Daniel's case moved. I'm really close, you guys. I'm very close. And I need you guys to continue, if you want to help me, continue to send those letters in every week, as many as you can. You can get churches, anybody just make bulk of them. You don't have to have return stamps. Just get them out there. If you want to donate to my cause, 
donate a book of stamps, uh, some letters, I mean, some envelopes to, for yourself to mail these things off. That That's a donation for me. And yeah. so I'll say, if you guys want to help, that's how you can help right now currently. Absolutely. And share the story. Make sure you share Dave's story. Hey, yes, of course. Uh, yeah, of course. Especially this conversation right here. Um, there's a lot that was being said here, a lot of information, a lot of uh, uh, eye-opening piece of pieces of information uh, that that brings more questions to the fact that there is foul play in this situation. I also have a members chat that I want to grab really quick, and it says here, sure. uh, Ladybug13, thank you so much for being a member for the past nine months. She said in her members chat, she said, passenger airbag would only deploy if someone sitting in that seat and that's interesting because in the in the footage in the photo let me just show that real quick yes both are deployed both are deployed so there could have been somebody else in that car but what's really really messed up about the situation is again forensic forensics has not been fully utilized in that entire car that is the biggest problem of this situation he right. could have had somebody in the car somebody could have been try, trying to carjack him there there right. are so many possibilities of what happened here and they have not 50 law enforcement has not fully exercised every possibility they have not exhausted every possibility that's the reason why we have david on the show to talk about this so i urge every single last one of y'all please go over to his website please help find daniel.com at the bottom it says fill out or please download the pdf for your mail-in protest the more letters that go in the more alert these the, and more awareness we can bring towards this case okay now the other thing too and i'm going to say this as well please go and follow him on twitter okay that's also please help find daniel it's at please help find four okay please go and check that out follow him there okay but also something that's really 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 important i do want to share with you guys as well is that there will be a vigil and he will be back to remind us of this candlelight vigil but there will be a candlelight vigil on the very day that that marks the two-year anniversary of daniel robinson's disappearance Again, this is going to be a big event. Uh, they will be he will be streaming live on on Streamyard. Uh, a bunch of guest appearances will be showing up. Uh, so please join in on this Unity Candlelight Vigil, okay? For Daniel C. Robinson on his two year anniversary. Again, the only way, as 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 he as David beautifully said, the only way that this case ever gets cold is when people stop talking about it. That's right. So please continue right. to do exactly what you're, we're doing right now, which is keeping his name out there, saying right. his name, hashtagging his name, hash, hashtagging justice for Daniel or find hashtag find uh, Daniel Robinson. Whatever it is, keep hashtagging those things. Keep sharing those things. David, I want to say again, Thank you so much for taking this time to blow the lid off this story. Um, give us some serious bombshells. A lot of us are shocked. I am. I'm absolutely floored with all the information I received here. And I'm sure a lot of the fam is as well. And I hope that this inspires them to share, tell the story, get justice, and get clarity, transparency for Daniel Robinson. David, thank you again for being here. Take care of that voice and God bless, man. Thank, thank you so much for having me on. I truly appreciate you and everybody uh, in, in your chats. Uh, thank you guys. Thank you so much. And don't forget real quick, don't forget other families as well. Uh, there's many thousands of people go missing a day in this country. Don't forget about those families. So keep them in your prayers. Um, and uh, don't forget about sharing their story. You hear those stories like for every family that's very crucial that you guys share we're reliant on that as a family member absolutely 
Absolutely. Well, hey, my brother, we'll be in touch very soon um, yes, on sir. June 23rd. Would love to have you back on to to remind everybody of this candlelight vigil um, that you're going to be hosting and putting together because uh, we'd love to bring, be able to spread and, and share more awareness over this. So again, I appreciate you coming on and uh, we'll be talking to you soon. All right. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you. Thanks for your time. No problem, brother. Bye. Take care. All right, guys. So as I always say over and over and over again, I urge every single last one of y'all to please share this feed, share this story, talk about Daniel Robinson, talk about it. This is the wildest, strangest, jaw-dropping story. I've heard in a really, really long time, and you know we talk about a lot of crazy stuff on this show. But the fact that there's lack of care, the lack of urgency that we're seeing on so many different angles, the fact that there are questions that have not been answered, that haven't even been investigated in, says a lot about what's going, what's really going on surrounding this particular story. It's very, very frustrating, and it's very, very, ah, uh, it just angers me. And you saw me. A lot of this information was just brand new. I had just learned right then and there. So I urge you guys, please go over, sign the petition, send those, those letters uh, as he asked. Please support. Please spread the word. The only way, again, the only way that this becomes a cold case is if we stop saying his name and stop bringing up this case. So let's, let's keep talking. Let's start hashtagging, okay? So that's all I ask, guys. It's very, very simple. Okay? Now, also, I will say this, too. Um, you go to the website, okay? Uh, it is linked at the top of the chat. Please go and check that out. Go over there. All the information is on that website. Petitions and whatnot. Go over there and do that. That would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Okay? Anyway, guys, that is the show. I appreciate all y'all for being here. Really does mean a lot. There's a lot to break down, a lot to consume. Holy cow. But it was a conversation that we needed to have nonetheless. Man, I hope we can find a way that if we keep talking like this, we keep bringing up these this story, we keep bringing up stories like this, we can get swift justice. That's what I'm hoping for. Again, without you guys sharing, without you guys hashtagging, this story goes cold. So let's bring them home. Let's help bring him home. Share this feed on your Twitter, Facebook, wherever. Okay? Instagram, Snapchat, if you use that. Please, share, share, share. Okay? Because this is a story that I feel like the Robinson family has just been getting nothing but the runaround. And that's wrong. Don't you agree? I think it's the runaround. And that's not cool. So please... Before you leave, do me a favor. Hit that like button down below. All right? Send it past 500 likes before you leave. A like doesn't cost a thing, but it does help get this story out there. Okay? And if you have not done that yet, hit that subscribe button. That would be greatly appreciated. Of course, also, if you want to support this channel, because I talk about a lot of stuff on this channel, and I'm trying to bring up more interviews like this more often, Please hit that join button down below. That would be greatly, heavily appreciated, okay? And, of course, if you want to support even more, by all means, go join my Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash The Pascal Show. All right? One hell of a show, guys. One hell of an interview. One hell of a conversation. My mind is absolutely blown. Um, so I need to go and, uh, you know digest a lot of this this info right now but hopefully you guys do the same and i'll be seeing you guys very very soon it's time to get going okay guys love every single last one of y'all be good to yourselves be good to one another and i'll see you guys very very soon i'll be on a, in a little 
couple hours live with Andrea Burkhart. So be on the lookout for that. Okay. This is the Pascal Show. Bye.